Well, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back. George Morgan here at your service. It's PSGL, it's Wednesday night, it's Spain tonight as well. Lots on the table, lots of battling. The title contest is still alive and kicking. And Jack, it's only taken us 10 rounds. We're on the 11th, it's all to play for. Bohemond goes on the inside and takes the lead on the final lap of the race. Now it's side by side between Bohemond and Bonar. But Bohemond's got the inside. And he's the against star here in this phenomenal race. Cameron Dowd looking to take P2 in his very first PSGL F1 PC race. Incredible. You see that team is One and a half seconds. TRS. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to PSGL for the seventh round of E-Series. Now, we all know it should Seven. realistically be round eight, Josh, but yes. because of EA's brilliant game servers last week, we're here for round yep. seven instead, and we're going to be repeating um, in the next week. We'll have a look at that in a second. But yes, welcome back, everyone. The Qatar Grand Prix, Josh. This could be a very good race or a very bad race, couldn't it? Certainly could be. There's a lot which can go into it. I mean, is it... You go to a MotoGP circuit with four wheels attached <laughs> to a vehicular mobile, right? You're going to expect it yep. to be difficult to overtake. We're going to be looking for turn one, prime overtaking opportunity. Other than that, drivers are going to have to get a little creative. Think about turn 10, maybe going for a late lunge. There's a lot which can go on, but it could lead to an absolute banging race. Not expecting any rain. It isn't a desert after all, but we have been surprised before. Yeah, it could be good, but in the past it's not been the best. I've done a few commentaries here in the past, and sometimes it's all right, sometimes it's a little bit dismal. But we'll have a look at the calendar, of course, here for the rest of this season. So, of course, we're here today for Qatar next Wednesday. Yes, we're going to be back once again for Imola to repeat that round that should have been held last Friday. Then, the Friday following, two days later... We're off to Mexico, so completely moving over the other side of the world. And then we have our break week on April the 12th, which you all know why that break week is there. And then Maybe. we're on the April the 19th on the Friday again. We're here for Las Vegas. And then we end the season off in Brazil on April the 26th. So, Josh, this little yes. bit now between here, Imola and Mexico, the drivers are going to have a lot of work to do in, a lot of sh you know, in, in such a short time. Yeah, have those short preparation windows. Yes, the drivers, they know how the circuits are. They know what the circuits look like. We're, we're not going to be that naive, right? They've done practice on all of these tracks for hours and hours. But it's getting back into that momentum, getting back into the swing of things that a lot of these drivers could potentially struggle with. But certainly a team which I think has certainly had a, a slight kick up the rear as of recent weeks would be Williams. Of course, yep. over in the standings, now leading with the 222 points, followed by F7R on 211. Very fine margins between a lot of these teams. Only 11 points back there from Williams. It's certainly going to be a bit of a challenge watching them try and, you know, squabble themselves back up. But we know F7R, we know what they're capable of. Surprise pole position, surprise results. Anything is going to be capable for them. And then slightly further down, we've got Scuderia Ferrari on 184. RHG, after a good set of runs recently, getting a good help, helping handful of points with, uh, of course, the likes of uh, Jord uh, Norstik and Tamash Gal, and, of course, Thomas Ronha helping just alleviate a little bit of pressure. Then, of course, we've got Race Clutch slightly further behind. Six points back off them is SRC, who, of course, had that fantastic start around Azerbaijan, but weren't quite able to live up to it. But... You never know. This could be a turning point for them. First time, they didn't necessarily get into that top 10 last week. There's a, not last week, the week before, but they've got a chance, right? This is where we're going to have to start building relay the foundations because this short moment is going to be pivotal for the rest of their season. And we've got the Loche at 154, TF10 on 108, and then Novus and Thomas Engelson racing down at the bottom on 69 and 67 points. Um, it's been a tough one for those two. You know, we mention it every single week. Yeah. They always seem to end up getting the bad the bad rub of a draw, right? Yeah. They end up drawing a short straw, you know, not always having the most fortuitous strategy, not always having, you know, that little rub of the green that they need that other teams around them have got, like TF10, like the Loche, where they've been able to work a little bit of magic. Of course, Ois Lawrence's win around Silverstone was massive for him, but everything's still wide open in this championship because of the way the point system works. Yeah, of course. And I've got to say, as a, um, a Birmingham City fan, I do feel for all NVR and TES um, fans, because I know what it feels like to be at the bottom uh, of the standings, or at least close to the bottom <laughs> of the standings, of course. 
<laughs> Indeed, but we can see in the chat. Hello, everyone. Welcome in. It seems Oscar has got um, a lot of love in the chat there from Joey yes. and Timon. Hello, Oscar. Welcome in. Hello, Timon, Turbs, Tatsor, James. Welcome in. Hello, Joey as well. Welcome in, everybody here for the Qatar Grand Prix in PSGL E-Series. And they will have a quick look at the, um, at the lineups before we get our way in. And we can see, of course... Lots of Ferrari, very similar lineup to usual. You have got Dylan and Ace fan. Then Race Coach, I believe, have got. Um, I think they got. Um, I think they've got. Who is it now? They've made a change. It's Yoris. Wait, they there. had a last minute swap. Yes, didn't Yoris they? and Sergio. Then Veloce Academy have Declan and Jack. Um, RHG have Jos Nordijk and Tamash Gell. Um, F7R have Tiger Hardy and Louis Valentin. MVR with six and Linhart and Timo Zlankovic. Um, TES with Fanat Moraviak and Yane Trepkov. SRC with Duncan Hoffland and Louis Welch. Williams with Ishmael Fassi and Kian Gundup. And finally, I forgot to mention TF10, who have got Max Wiesel and Felipe Sosa. Now, those two in the TF10 car, I would say so far, Josh, that is their, I'd say their strongest lineup here this season. Yeah, you did, you did mention it earlier, but we do have a, uh, a little bit of breaking news. Um, oh. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know how I'm going to be able to explain this one to you without breaking your heart. Um, Lipe won't be racing. It was a last-minute swap again. Uh, Markadoz is in. Uh, but again, alongside Max Wiesel, anything can happen. Yeah, of course. And we can see now a few cars heading out onto track. And the first one being one of the TF10s. It'll be Joel Marquard who heads out first onto circuit here on a set of the intermediate tyres. Now, that is something we've seen all season long. It's nothing new at all. The drivers like to go out... On a set of the Inters to kind of, you know, not get any disadvantage from running out on a set of softs just to make your first tests and make sure all your, equip uh, all your equipment is working properly, we can see as well. You know, Tripkov on a set of the Intermediates as well on circuit right now. Then we've got the other Mercedes, that'll be the other TES car, a fan at Maravac, who was the fastest guy. Um, I think it was season two qualifiers when we sit, when we was here at Qatar, set a, a point seven was very quick, was, you know, a lot quicker than many of the others behind. So he should also be looking to do well here, especially in that qualifying phase. But, of course, in the qualifiers, we never see um, a race. So we haven't really seen Fran drive around this circuit for the 29 laps this race presents. So we'll see what uh, Mr. Moraviak can do in TES. And then we can see as well one of the other TF10s of Max Wiesel heading out onto circuit as well to get underway with his first eight laps. So many cars, um, Josh, staying in the pit lane. Yeah, it's certainly a, a slightly interesting tactic, isn't it? I mean, we know intermediate tyres, even some drivers, using an, uh, well, electing to go for that medium compound at the start of a qualifying session just to get themselves prepped, make sure the hardware's in, make sure they're getting dialed into yeah. the track. But it can, you know, come back to bite you around a circuit like Qatar, where it is very uh, high pace, high downforce, high gearing as well. So when you do end up having a slight step, it can be so difficult to correct it. It could potentially be better for a lot of these drivers just to go out on that soft tyre, wait a little bit, and then get themselves more familiar with what the soft tyre is like around this circuit. Because yes, it is one of those things that they would have done laps, they would have practised, but it's all just about having that familiarity. If you're going to have to take one or two corners to readjust from going from the intermediates back to the softs, it all adds up. But we can see a couple of these drivers now. Start of a lap, Joel Marquard. Yeah, well, the what, uh, there's a lot to say about this young man. There is, you know, I believe he's just previously moved over from PS very recently as well onto PC. So we'll see what he can do here in um, PSGL E-Series. But, you know, this track, it's very quick flowing. You know, if you make one mistake in one corner, the next three corners, you're really, really compromised in. So you can't afford to make a mistake in any corner here on this circuit. For example, the flat eight section at turns 12 through to 14. You go wide at turn 12, that is 13 and 14 done. You're going to lose so much time through there. So you've got to make sure on your laps you keep yourself in the full flow you don't lose any distraction and run wide here run wide there because that will be your lap done with we can see of course Joel heading through in towards the um, final centre here of course around this circuit and we know for a fact that these laps mean nothing hence why he's having to lift heavily because he's on a set of the intermediate tyres you'd normally be going full th um, full flat through that section of the circuit as we can see him now round the final corner heading up towards the start finish line, a very long run to the line here in Qatar. So you're going to keep your foot down for a long way off this straight, and we'll see the first lap time there. A 124.866 from um, from Joel. We'll see as well a few more cars coming through. Moraviak going to complete that lap. It was invalidated, but that would have been a 25.4. And then we've got Max Vesel just heading through into the end of that first sector. 
Yeah, and I feel like something we should also mention for this qualifying segment, ERS is going to be absolutely crucial around here. You can't let the game dictate where it wants to deploy the ERS, because if you end up doing that, by the time you come out of that final corner, and you end up start shifting up, as soon as you get to that DRS uh, opportunity, where you can really open up that rear wing, you've run out of battery, you can't deploy any more for the lap. That can definitely come back to bite a couple of the drivers if it's not at the forefront of a mind. It's something they've got to be really considering heading down into turn one, turn two, uh, especially four and five as well. It's a great opportunity to toggle off the battery, get a little bit of recharge, and just not necessarily deploy as much as other drivers. So if we end up seeing a couple of drivers going a little bit slower in that first sector, you understand why. They're just waiting, try and save up a little bit more about ERS. So when it gets to that final straight, that last push towards the line, but really able to deploy everything in their uh, arsenal, so to say. Of course, as we can see there, Max Vies will go to second in the timings there with a 1 minute 24.973, but then again, we know that these times mean absolutely nothing. So we can see uh, Moravia can head through into the final couple of corners. He will be probably heading back into the pit lane. What does he choose to do? Yes, he'll head back into the pits here. And uh, we'll get onto a set of the soft tyres. And normally, in around two minutes' time, is when we see everyone head out onto the circuit. Once we hit around that 10 minute mark, we've still got 12 minutes and 45 seconds to go. And surprisingly, not many people out on the inter. So that's why there's not much action at all here at the start of this session. But we do know that there'll be five people going out here tonight because we have no qualifying bans, I believe. So that means there's a lot of pressure on those at the bottom. Normally, we have one or two qualifying bans. So there's only two or three people at risk. Here, that is not the case. Everyone is at risk in this session to go out in Q1. And of course, around a circuit like this, where it is pretty much a DRS train the whole way around, the last place yeah. you want to be is Denning last. We know for a fact that sometimes even the strategies, even an undercut or an overcut don't work because you can't really feed yourself back higher up in the train because once you've pitted and you've feed it back in, you're stuck with everyone, or you, you know, you're stuck with everyone still ahead of you. So it's very difficult to make a strategy work around this circuit. Absolutely. It very much feeds into the themes that we had at Portimao last night over in the regular season for a lot of these drivers. It is somewhat of a similar circuit. There can be limited overtaking opportunities everywhere else but turn one. Fortunately, around Portimao, there are some heavier braking zones, unlike around here, where it is very much ebb and flow. You're tucking into the slipstream, you're waiting for that dirty air to waft over. Uh, and really just trying to follow as close as you can, especially through that second sector. I mean, let's not even mention the triple right-hander at sector three. It's ridiculous, you know. Up through turn 12, 13, 14, any sort of hit of dirty air will drastically affect you. So, drivers are going to be kind of in that mindset where they want to run lower wings so they can get a better overtaking opportunity heading down into turn one. But the sacrifice in not only tire degradation, but potentially picking up a couple warnings, uh, maybe even a time penalty by running, a running it a little bit wide here and there, which again, can be a common theme throughout this circuit. But, <sighs> Mr. Richards, I do have an interesting fact for you about yeah. this circuit. 20 years ago, mm -hmm. it hosted its first MotoGP race. It's oh. 20 years old. Tw 2004 then, I'm sure that was... 2004? Yeah. It's almost as old as you. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. Well, no, no, sorry. It's older than me. I'm a few months younger. Oh my. I'm 19 and a half nearly, so I'm younger than this <laughs> circuit by half a year. So I suppose I suppose that's a good thing. And then again, I didn't realise this circuit was around that long because it doesn't look that old at all. I'm sure it's gone through many renovations since its opening back in 2004. But of course, back in 2004, it was never used for Formula 1. It hasn't been used for Formula 1 until 2021. It was originally for the MotoGP and also some, I believe in some cases, some of the GT3 championships and of course some of um, Qatar's local racing championships as well so it's a bit new to the formula one scene hence why it doesn't always promote the best on track action because it's not made for formula one cars formula one just thought you know what we'll make ourselves work here with this circuit as we can see many cars now heading out onto track to begin their first parts of qualifying obviously the first will be one of the esteban i believe that might be tygo no. hardy you know it'll be libby valentine who goes out first and remember josh this man coming to um, e series at the start of the season, and I thought F7R, you know, maybe maybe around P5, P6 in the standings. First round, Louis Vanti put it on pole. Yes, you know, we we came in with the intention. You know, everyone sort of has their their pre pre mock ups uh, of where everyone would finish. You know, we was expecting Ferrari dominance once again in E series. Uh, Williams to try and make a challenge for like some race clutch up there as well. But F7R. They're holding a the mantle for community teams at the yeah. minute, aren't they? They're really showing what, it, what it's all about. Yeah. The fact, you know, sim racing can carry you any which way. And uh, I do believe Tycho Hardy and Lou Valentino are prime examples of that. Putting it up there with the big dogs. 
the uh, official Formula One eSport drivers mm -hmm. and showing they're not far behind. They're hot yep. on their heels. All it takes is one slight mistake in a qualifying session in a race with that DRS trade. They're right there to capitalize on the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it's what they've done so well, consistently finishing in the points, grabbing themselves a beautiful total. And it's kept them in the hunt for this title with, well, after this one, four rounds remaining, anything still to play for, yep. they might be one of the favorites to go on and win this. Yeah, which is something I don't think many people thought. I don't think F7R even thought that at this point, seven rounds in, they would be fighting here for the um, E-Series Championship. Of course, there are, I believe, about 11 points back from Williams at the top. And the key thing to note is F7R have only had two podiums. Williams, yeah. ahead of them, have had four. Ferrari have had four. RHG have had two wins and, you know, three podiums. But the key thing I noticed with um, F7R is that they've had the least amount of non-finishing positions. Williams have been out the top 10, or I should say, been out the top 10, such no points, four times. Ferrari four times. All those behind four, five, six. Whereas F7R have only missed the top 10 twice. Yeah, you could argue both those opportunities wasn't necessarily down to the pace itself. They were, you know, instances which happened in the race. Uh, they got caught up in. It wasn't necessarily their fault. Yeah. So you've got to really take into consideration that if things went the way they wanted for those races, you could almost guarantee them finishing in the points every single round of this championship so far. But of course, we still have a very technical, very difficult race coming up, of course. It's a very long one as well. Yep. It won't necessarily feel long for us watching, but for the drivers waiting, managing their pace, sort of controlling what they're doing all throughout the circuit, there's no rest. There's no respite for these drivers. They're going to be on the limit 100% of the time around a circuit like Qatar, which is the reason why it can be so physically demanding for these drivers, not only in the real world, but also in the sim rigs. Yep. I just hope they've got water next to them. So, Josh, I'm not going <laughs> to sing anything, but you make oh, a good dear. point, and uh, it does make me think of a song called No Rest for the Wicked. I'm not going to sing it, though. I know you did last <laughs> night in Portimao, uh, but no, we're not going to sing it, but it does make that song come to mind here. For all 20 drivers here on circuit, we can see, of course, Louis Valentino heading in to the final couple of corners. We'll see what he can do to set the benchmark here in PSGL round seven, of course, here at Qatar. Q1, of course, so five drivers will drop out at the end of this session. And with six minutes left to go, we'll see what can Valentin do. To the line he goes, it will be a 120.450. Jack West heads the line. He goes faster by two tenths of a second there. A brilliant opening run by Jack West. Tiger Hardy just gets ahead of his teammate there by a tenth of a second. Sergio Sabrino splits the two S7Rs as Keen Godendorp goes to the top there. And we've got a few more cars coming through. Yaris Crozen. Goes into P3 there. The Aston Martin, that'll be SRC. Louis Welch goes into P6. We'll see one of the MVRs come through. That's sixth and into P8. He goes. Then we'll have... Ooh, that'll be Max Dylan Hoxwood going to sixth. And Tomasz Gale goes up to the top. Yeah, Max Wiesel's purple here. He's looking very, very solid on this lap. Uh, we've also had Ishvan Puki got that medium compound attire invalidating his run. But Max Wiesel, he's looking very, very solid so far. I mean, you know better than anyone, Rich. Well, he's he's a wily old fox, isn't he? He can yeah. pull out laps <laughs> out of nowhere. And he's certainly living up to the name at the minute. He's going to expect him to come up towards the line. Oof. What a laugh. There you go. Yeah, brilliant that there from Max Wiesel. And well, that, you know, you do look at Max Wiesel and you do think of Fernando Alonso there when you look at that man's face. A very old person, 34 years old he is. He's double many of the ages of many people here Bloody in the Unis series. You know, he's getting on a bit, but he's doing a good job here so far for the TF10 team to top the start of Q1 with Ishmael Fassi in second and then the two RHGs in third of Joost Nornike and Tamash go there. Well, a bit of redemption for their qualifying last season as Tamash only gets into a bit of an incident there with the race clutch, one of his fellow ex-teammates in the past there. Tamash yes. attempted to avoid the Alpine as he headed through in towards turn 12 and well that was uh, very wide there from Mr Joris Crozen indeed as he headed through in towards turn 12 so that is all the first runs done and dusted and well Ferrari not looking too strong I did speak to Dylan earlier on he said he didn't do that much practice here so yeah we'll see what that does for him so far he's two and a half tenths off of the fastest time his teammate Isvan Puki made a mistake on his lap but he was of course did you say Josh on was did you say medium tyres Yes, yes, he went out on medium tyres, very early on picked up an invalidation in his run, after that he was more than happy to sit back a little bit, relax it, but end of the day, he went out, he tried something a little different, mm -hmm. but coming towards the end of his Q1 session, it could potentially put him at risk, we know he's not a driver where he should be battling to try and get out of this bottom five, but if he ends up picking up another invalidation on his second lap here, 
four minutes left of the session. He's going to have a real, real hurry to try and get it back to the pits, get himself back into the operating window where he can go for another lap in time. Uh, make sure he's real dialed into the circuit. And then again, there's a lot of potential for, you know, missed opportunities, risks yeah. to be taken, uh, taken a hold of. But uh, for one minute, I don't believe Mr. Dylan Warren at all, right? How many times has he said, think back to uh, the Monaco race uh, yeah. from last last season, right? Mm -hmm. I've had no practice, I'm washed, won't yeah. be anywhere. Mm -hmm. See, if... he says that to me all of the time. Every race I commentate over Dylan, he messages to me before, and we have a quick chat, and half the time it's, oh, not quick. But I have a feeling, and I say to him every time, that he does it on purpose, because he knows that when he says he does terrible, he will do well. So I think tonight Dylan could get a podium. And I've said that, and he's not going to do well, but I'm hoping that his jinx and my jinx counteract and he makes him still do well in the end. That's what I'm hoping. I'm going to try and work with the um, with the um, um, psychology of this Dylan's is... Ferrari car and his F123 game. But we can see the top four, apart from Max, retiring on their lap times. And now you look there, Josh. P9 to P16, a tenth of a whole second. That's P9. Those ahead... P5, he's only two tenths of a whole second. So here, there's going to be a lot of people and a bit of risk. Yeah, it really comes down to which sort of lines the drivers take, of course. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be one optimal line. But it's about navigating around the optimal line to make sure your car's going to be at the key performance when it gets later on in towards the lap. Kian Gorondorf is a brilliant example. He took a little bit out of that first and middle sector just so he could finish on a real high, setting that purple final sector, carrying the extra speed through. Uh, exactly where he needs to, especially the likes of Turn 13, where he can really get to the maximum apex speed and carry that bit more speed, because his tyres are slightly cooler than the rest who have pushed in that first and second sector. Very interesting how these drivers are all going to kind of break it down and, and see, and maybe fill each other out just a little bit to understand which drivers want to push where. I'm sure the engineers are all glossing over the data now, finding out which drivers are strong in which sectors, uh, and trying to pinpoint where drivers will need to improve their lap time, where they might need to save a little bit of time, where they can maybe yeah. push that a little bit harder. Of course, and we can see here the first to head out onto track will be the two S7Rs and Ist van Pukki. So he was confident there by going on a set of the mediums at the start. Didn't make the lap finish anyway, but he was confident, which is, I suppose, a good thing to see. So he should be on some very fine paces. We can see there a few of the five pace grid penalties heading out for a couple of drivers, but we all know they mean nothing because we will have a restart between the qualifying and the race. But now we can see Ist van Pukki going to be the first one here to start the final runs here of Q1. And well, can Ferrari get themselves out of the drop zone? It's not something we hear very often, is it, Josh, after their final no. recently? Took a a P2 and P3 back in Britain, seeing this one at a bit of risk, and also Dylan at a bit of risk, is not something we really expected, was it? No, he's not exactly in that perfect window, is he? You know, ideally you'd want to be maybe a couple hundreds uh, slightly higher up, so he's, you know, at least got Tiger Hardy behind him for, a, you know, a little bit of leeway looking towards that championship battle, but he doesn't have that level of security he would necessarily want, but neither does Van Pukki currently sitting there with no time whatsoever. It's imperative he's able to keep it within the track limits to get a time on the board. Because at the end of the day, none of these drivers want egg on their face, but you can already see that Ishvan Pukki just recharging a little bit of battery, heading, uh, heading through four and five, being very, very cautious on where he's deploying it to make sure he's got enough for that final run down to the line. Of course, we can see now Isvan heading through into that middle sector at the moment. I think set quite a decent first sector on uh, on this lap. So we'll see what he can do in this second sector, of course. And this is where you can gain the most time. Just heading out of turn 10 now, up towards turn 11. And this is where you probably gain the least time, sector 3. Sector 2, you gain the most. Sector 3, you gain the least as he heads through now into turn 12. Then into turn 13. And then in towards turn number 14, flat out through that whole section. And then... You head onto a bit of a, well, more of a shift down and lift into turn 15. Then into turn 16, it's a full breakdown to around fourth or fifth gear. And we'll see Isvan head through there very nicely taken by the Ferrari. Now, he needs, I'd say, to be safe a point two if he wants to see himself through to Q2. He heads up towards the line. What will it be for Pukki? Up to P7. That should be safe there for the Ferrari. Yeah, you you would think so. You would hope so for Ferrari's sake. Oh, Louis out. Louis out. Ooh. That's an interesting Ooh. one just for a seven R. Yeah, uh, looking here as well. Uh, do have a Duncan who invalidated his lap time there, and also fair few other drivers just picking up a couple warnings here and there. But it's all going to very much come down to how well they've been able to keep their tyres towards the end of this session, isn't it? 
indeed. And Dylan dropping down further. Trep coming to P12 there for TES. Valentin back into the pits. Welch is out of this session. What can Zelenkiewicz do? Can he get himself out of the drop zone? To the line, he does, goes into pit on there. Dylan Warren is in a lot of risk here, depending on what the TS can do. Frenet's gone off circuit, so he's out. What can Sixton do? Only 19, so Dylan will be safe. But SRC, both drivers out of Q1. It's not what the output would like, of course, is it? It's very unfortunate. 16, 17, but, you know, silver lining. They've got a little bit of time here to try and engineer it and uh, cook up a strategy which could really work around this circuit. It'll take a little bit of extra brain power from the engineers over there, but we know what they're capable of. We've seen it earlier on in the season. They have a very strong team behind them. Uh, really looking, trying to maximize everything possible. But to run you through the order for this qualifying session, we do have Max Wiesel grabbing the uh, Q1 pole time heading into Q2. Then we've got Jack West, Sergio Sabrina, Ishmael Fassi, Jos Nordijk, Tycho Hardy. Again, F7R. Just showing themselves up there. Tamash Gal, Jal Marquard, Declan Barrett, Kian Gordendorp, Istvan Puki, only P11. Expect him to make a little jump up in Q2. Timas Lenkovic, Josh Krodzen, uh, Yane Tripkov, Dylan Warren, by the skin of his teeth. There yeah. I say. Nine thousandths of a second. But we do have to say goodbye to both the SRC drivers of Duncan Hoffland, Louis Welsh, Louis Valentin, Sixton Lindhart, Frederick Morawiak. For me, there, Louis Valentin's the biggest shock. Of course. Well, no, actually, Duncan Hoffman, I think, is Josh. You know, he, he no, just no. racing T1 and F1. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. But Lou Valentin, given recent form he's shown. Mm, true. Yeah, I think I think both of those two have been big shocks to see out of Q1 and also a big shock to see the whole of SRC out of Q1. Now, a lot of work needs to be done down in that part of the, um, the paddock. So, yeah, they'll be sitting here now for the next about half an hour looking what they can do, working out the strategies to go in towards this next, uh, obviously, well, when they get to their next session, it will be the race, but before they get into the race, we have Q2 and Q3 still to go through. We can see now a few cars heading out already onto circuit. Well, I've got on board with Max Fiesel here heading out onto track. We've got one of the Williams's first out. That will be um, Ishmael Fassi Ishmael. Hmm. heading out first. And I think Ishmael's a driver that's very quick around this circuit. We've seen him race here many times, and from what I've seen, he tends to be quite quick, so he could be someone here looking for pole position. But Max Fiesel... He's been looking very strong himself. So TF10, I don't think they would argue with the pole at all, would they? I think they'd be more than happy to have a pole position because in the standings, they're 39 points clear of TES and NMVR, but they're 46, second, uh, 46 seconds, 46 points back from Veloci Academy. If VA have a bit of a stinker here and Max can get himself a top three, top four, they could edge that and get closer and try and catch back up. Yeah, I mean, they need it. Let, let, let's be frank, right? They've had three top 10 finishes so far this season. That coming around Spa, Catalonia, and then, of course, uh, the last race we did here at Silverstone. Mm -hmm. They need a bit more consistency on a points growing basis. Even if it isn't a top three, I'm sure they'll be more than happy with both drivers finishing in the top 10 for the first time this season. They need it at the end of the day, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. They, they need some very, very good points here um, tonight in Qatar, which is realistically a very good opportunity because we know that overtaking is scarce. We know it's not easy to overtake on a track which is, you know, very limited in terms of making those positions. So if Max and um, Joel can qualify high, they've got a very good chance of getting some very, very good points. Joel as well got P6 at the end of that session, only half a tenth yeah. back from Max. So, you know, he's also quite good on the pace. Of course, I believe it's um, Tier 10 Marketers, I believe, back on the PlayStation platform. So we know, you know, Joel's definitely got a name for himself on the PS side. It's just about coming over to PC you know, and showing... What he can do, of course, compared to some of the eSports level drivers here in this lobby. We can see now laps being uh, underway. We've got, first of all, Dylan Warren heading out onto circuit. P15 in Q1, surviving by literally nine thousandths of a whole second. He's going to find a lot here in this session now. Yeah, he certainly does. And uh, Ishmael Fassi taking a very opportunistic moment here to try and pick up a little bit of a toe. But you can already see him struggling through the dirty air. And he ends up running it a little bit wide and invalidates his lap time there. So... We can expect Ishmael Fassi to dive it back into the pits here, but Dylan Warren, he doesn't need to worry about the car behind at this moment, does he? He's no. just got to keep his head down, focus on the apex for the next corner, dial himself into the circuit. He's got to find the time here for this first lap. Just guarantee him a little bit of a safety window, a little bit of a breather from the cars behind, where he can really start to then push the car in the latter runs in this session. But so far, 
is looking pretty good. It is indeed there, a 53.4 for Dylan Warren in that second set. It's a red car being followed by five blue cars as they all head down now in towards turn 15 and turn 16. We can see Dylan Warren navigate that first. Ooh. Very wide, completely invalid there for Dylan Warren. Big shame for him to suffer an invalidation. So we'll go on board here with the race clutch driver of Yoris Crows. And what can he do? He will head back into the pits along with Joel oh. and Max and Sergio, Isma and Dylan. None of them setting their lap times. Some of them could have done it, but they choose not to. I don't know why they do it, but I notice it every single time we go to Q2, they go out, but don't set the lap. Don't know why, uh, but they do it. I just think they like to tease us, to be honest. They like to, you know, think we're going to be uh, starting the qualifying session, yeah, but they, they right dive it back actually, in the pits. No. <laughs> They're very cheeky, very cheeky. But can I expect all those to have used a scrub set of tyres for that one? Not going to be the end of the world for their running plans for a remainder of its Q2 session, but... Something I do want to just keep an eye on is the drivers who didn't go out. Yeah. Are they doing that in a, in a more tactical or a more reserved way? Whether they're taking this extra time mm -hmm. to uh, pick up information from other engineers or where they can pick up uh, maybe a couple extra thousandths of a second. Because realistically, it's not going to be a whole temp you're losing around a corner. No. The only heavy breaking point, realistically, is down at turn one. And turn six. And I wouldn't even say turn one's much of a breaking zone, really, is it compared to, to you know, compared to most corners? Yep, so true. You drop down to fifth gear, but you're instantly on the power. So, yeah, the realistic biggest breaking zone's round turn number six. You get a bit of a breaking down at turn seven, a little bit of a breaking down at turn 16 and turn one. But apart from that, there's not much really in the lap. A lot of it is being able to carry minimum speed through, being able to just lift perfectly in certain corners like... Turn four and turn five, that's a key place to gain time if you can get it perfectly right to navigate the car through at the best speed possible. And also, we know sometimes that's the corner on the circuit unless it's changed, where drivers tend to tend their tend to turn their ERS off so they've got enough to run to the line because it's quite a long run and you don't always have enough ERS to power the car to that start finish line. So that's why sometimes you do hear them turn it off for a split second in turns four and turns five just to, you know, have enough power to run it to the end of the lap. We can see Keen Goldendorp first out onto the circuit now on his eight lap, of course. Then in 13th, obviously, many drivers have been out, but none of them setting time. So, you know, this is where we'll see the realistic first times being set in the session. Some of them are on used tyres. Some of them will be on new tyres, of course. So these first runs aren't always something to look at. Yeah, but certainly something uh, I, I, I always like, and I always love noticing. Whenever Kian Gordon Dorps in the lobby, he wants to come out uh, at the start of the pack in the qualifying. He's more than happy to uh, be the first car to break it and, and kind of cause the rest of the cars to follow him out. But you'll very rarely see him be the first one to cross the line to start his time. He's more than happy to back it up, and you can see it here going extremely slowly in his middle sector, just trying to find himself that perfect window. But we see Tycho Hardy all equal to the mind games, more than happy to sit there because Tycho Hardy equally loves not being that first car. You'll see him a couple cars back occasionally and it's really where he seems to flourish when he's got that car in front of him that he can dial in, chase down. He just seems to be able to perform better. It might be a mental thing where he feels like he's having to chase the car in front and he's able just to extract that little bit of extra time. But whatever it is, it's working for him. Yeah, indeed. Oh, I think that's a good thing uh, about Keane. He, he, you know, he can get into a session and doesn't really get affected by what's going on around him, which I think is a brilliant thing to see. You know, he came from PS, and when he came to PC, he was one of the stand, you know, standout drivers that literally didn't have any sort of change phase. They just went into it, and it was normal. Money drivers, you can see them go to PC, and they have a bit of a struggle. They have to get themselves, you know, worked up to it. But Keane came straight to PC and was, you know, boom, straight getting for podiums in, in PCF2. So I think that's a good thing to see for Keane. He hasn't really had to get adjusted to the, to the PC side. He just got into it. And now he's able to be, you know, at his peak or near uh, where his peak will be. So we'll see what Keane can do here on this next lap here. Just heading through in towards that first sector so far. It's looking good here for the Williams driver. Obviously, his teammate Ismail Fassi is on a lap time. He invalidated earlier on. So he obviously didn't get the best of luck in that first part of Q2. But we'll see what he can do on his next run as well. He's just heading through into the final couple of corners. Keane in that first sector there at 26.300. So looking decent here so far for the Williams, but still two sectors to go. And as I say, this second sector, you tend to gain quite a lot of time through here. Yeah, again, it's all all down to the setups they really want to try and orientate around. We know Williams, we know their engineering team, but fantastic at the end of the day. But would have dialed in the setups, make sure it's exactly to each of the individual driver's likings, make sure they're able to feel comfortable around the circuit, but not too comfortable to sacrifice for lap time. That's the key part when you're trying to dial in that setup, trying to get that maximum time as we see Kian here taking them perfectly flat. Fantastic stuff. 
from a young Williams driver with a slight little downshift, flicking the car and keeps it well within track limits, showing he still has a little bit of room he can work with for the next lap in this Q2 session, but I don't think he'll necessarily need it because so far this has been a fantastic lap. He's got the ERS to burn all the way up to the line. What are we expecting? Sub point two, surely. There we point go. One, zero, point zero. one. Brilliant lap there. As we can see, Tago Hardy go quicker there with a 19.992. Jack West goes quicker with a 20.083. Uh, of course, quicker there than Keen Golden up. So he goes into second place. Sergio Sereno pops himself up into third. A few more laps coming through. I need to find someone who's heading into the final couple of corners. We'll go on board here with Jos Nordijk as Declan Barrett goes into second place. Tamash goes into third. We'll see what can the other RHG can do. So the first one's in P3. What will the second one achieve as he heads to the line? Goes into P4. They're just behind with a point eight, uh, a point zero eight zero. Then we have a few more cars coming through. Dylan Warren heading through at the final corner as that will be Ishmael Fassi going into P7. It would have been Yoris going into P9. Tima into P10. Then it will be, I think, Declan Barrett up into second. Or well, that was Joel Marcos already going up into fourth. Dylan into P8. What will Max Wiesel do? He goes up to second. Brilliant there from Max Wiesel. I mean, you... you uh... It gets to a point, it's expected of a driver. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at real life Formula 1, Max Verstappen, it's expected. Max Wiesel, very much the same. You just <laughs> expect that sort of lap time from him, don't you, at the end of the day. Fantastic work from the uh, the, the old Wiley Fox. Uh, really maximised his lap there out of sector 2, showing he might be running a little bit more downforce, or he might have just saved a little bit of those tyres to really put it to work for that middle sector. But whatever he's done uh, in that first and final sector to really prep himself for that lap, it's clearly worked. He was rapid in that middle side. Indeed, and we can see there the gaps there between everyone on the grid. So far, first down to P11. We'll look at the gap to leader. Um, on our screens, if it wants to show up, there we are. The gap to leader is... Oh, look at that. Two tenths separating the top 13. No one here is safe at all. No one at all. No. So this will be a very interesting next session here in... Well, the next ending here to qualifying two, of course. And obviously, we know that the bottom five go out. Tiger Hardy thinks he's safe. I think he's more than safe on his lap. Yeah. I think all those behind may have to go out again, especially those key and going up down. And so far, it's the two race clutches in the drop zone, along with Timis Lenkovic, Jone Trepkov, and Istvan Puki. Yet again, Istvan, oh, when he's left the session, that is not good at all. He's had a bit of a disconnect here. That is, yeah, that is bad for Ferrari. Yeah, it's it's not ideal, to say the very least. Um, but of course, it's one of those features. Hopefully, Istvan's <laughs> going to be able to get back into the uh, back into the session. He's got four minutes remaining. 4 minutes 20 to be exact. He can take his time, right? Just make sure you join properly, please. Last thing we want is another repeat of what happened last week with everyone going every which way. We've been good so far. Oh, news come through. Isfan's pedals have stopped working. Oh. Oh. Wow. That is now even far from ideal. That's, I, I, you know, I didn't think it could necessarily get worse, but somehow it has, hasn't it? Yeah. Oh, what a day for Ferrari. It's not going right. It's a reliability issues once again in the um, for the prancing horses. So Isfan, if he if he can't get back in because of his pedal, surely they're allowed to have some sort of swap and let someone join in and start from the back maybe because it would be a bit unfair for them not to have a driver. Yeah, especially in, in a hunt for the championship when it's this close, to be honest with you. I mean, 38 points. That's, what, first place and a solid points result between? Mm -hmm. Like... They're equally in contention here. Hopefully, he's able to either get the screwdriver out, get something working to try and fix them, or, you know, uh, so, something, just something to be able to get a representative, even if it's Ishvan on a keyboard at the end of the day. It's all still there, of course. Wouldn't be... Well, I say that. He might be quick on a keyboard. I don't know. I've never seen a person quick on a keyboard, <laughs> but, you know, the first time I've been corrected here. Yeah, I'll say that. I, I don't think it's that possible to be quick on a keyboard. But then again, there is some people that, like Louis Welch, are very quick on a controller, which still baffles me. I can't understand yes. how someone can be good on a controller. How someone can use no ABS on a controller for a start is one thing. Never mind be one of the quickest in the world. So, yeah, that will always be something that confuses me to till the day I die. The fact that Louis Welch can drive as quick as those on a two, three, maybe even more thousand pound setup. And he could do it on a cheap 50 paid Xbox controller. Maybe with a few little add-ons here and there. But yeah, it is, um, of course, brilliant oh, from oh. Louis. I'm sure he has, oh, like, oh. some sort of grip. What do they call them? Controller grips, is it, on the buttons? Maybe. Have you have you saw those little things from, like, uh, TikTok? Where it's, like, a little steering wheel yeah, for your I've controller? Yeah, I've seen those, yeah. And you can use your thumbs to... 
I think they're really cool. I don't think they're practical in the slightest. Was that, I'm not sure that... Was that because that's cheating? No. Because you're not no, using listen. the... You know, you're, you're changing the controller. No, right, okay. If using an elastic band <laughs> and a magnet to hold down my accelerator and turning for my time playing Gran Turismo around Daytona, was it classed as cheating? I don't think using a little steering input thing for your controls analog stick would class as cheating. <laughs> End of the day, it's a very cheap wheel. Yeah, true. It is. It's made out of plastic and it's about, what, three centimetres wide? You know, it's like the size yeah. of a 2p coin or maybe, obviously, it may be a little bit uh, a little bit bigger than that, but not much bigger, of course. But I'm looking here on the grid, and Joe Marquard thinks he's safe on his um, on his laptop. We'll see what it was set by the TF10 driver. It was, of course, a 120.073. Now, with those ahead, I think they're not safe. Those behind also know for a fact they're not safe. So I think, Joel, I don't think this is going to work. I, I think it could be out here because it's not the fact of how much the gap is now to those below it's the fact of all those behind will also be putting in brilliant laps to kind of make up for their gap or make up for their gap to the bottom five so everyone behind yeah. should theoretically get a lap time quicker than him because of the track being better yeah but well, i mean we we've saw it firsthand here haven't we theory doesn't always come to fruition um here at psgl certainly uh, a couple spanners could be in the works and maybe what Joel was hoping for is a couple of these drivers to get caught up with each other, get a little bit of dirty air from a car in front and end up making one or two invalidations because realistically that's all he needs is maybe one or two of these quick guys to end up picking up an invalidation on the lap yeah. and he could, by the skin of his teeth, see himself uh, scratch through. But end of the day, it's a risk. He feels comfortable enough to take it. You can only praise the young driver's uh, confidence for that sense. Of course, and we can see now the laps getting underway. I'm on board here with Jack West heading through in that second sector so far. He's currently up oh. by two thousandths of a second, Josh. So not by much, but he's up, which is a good thing to see. We'll see what he can do here on this lap. And there the track of flag is gone, and Nissan Puki will be starting from 15th. And if we don't get him in and we do get someone else, I believe it will be from last. So Ferrari's day is not looking too well here at all. And Jack West here is up by a tenth of a second. Joel is going to be under a lot of pressure here, Josh. Yeah, but... So, same up, we've got a couple drivers invalidating. Uh, we've got uh, Declan Barrett, Tamash Gal, and Yane Tripkov all picking up invalidations on their lap. Of course, Declan and Tamash, they're going to have that little barrier of Joel in between. But with drivers still coming up towards the line here, there's an awful lot still to be risked. Joel moving down into sixth after Kian's lap up into P4. And then we've got Yost goes up into uh -huh. P. Oh, to the top there with a point eight, Josh. What a lap that Ooh. is. The host Nord's like, settle down, please. What on earth is that last time? Fantastic stuff there from the young man. But we've got, still got more drivers yet to come across the line. Joel Marquard now, P10. Is Dylan Warren going to knock him out? I think he Never will. Never mind. Or he's already been put out. But, oh, yeah, he's out. That is it. That is it. Done and dusted yeah. here for Joel Marquard. He gets... Oh, Team Zelenkovic in the top 10. NVR into Q3. Ooh. Brilliant. Absolutely Hello. brilliant here. Cheeky. Dilla Warren, P10 as well, squeezing Ooh. through by the skin, thinnest of margins. And you've got to think, Yane Tripkov and Ishvan Puki, they could have been in there. They could have been in that top 10. Yeah. Keen and Tamash as well, A to Q2. What a surprise that is. Williams and, and um, R8G having two drivers out, uh, having a driver out, sorry, which they definitely don't need at all. But it's just Nordike that was quickest. In that Q2 session, ahead of Max Fiesel once again. And then we have Sergio Sabrina in third for Red which Very nice to see him up in third. And then we'll have Ishmael Fassi in fourth, followed by Tiger Hardy yet again in fifth. And the two for Loche Academies in P6 and P7. And then we have Zelenkovic for NVR in P8. Brilliant from himself. And then we have Race Clutch with Yoris in ninth. And then Dylan Warren for Ferrari, just about making it through to Q3. Um, just like he barely made it through to Q2. Lucky, lucky man, to say the least, I think, there. Indeed, yeah. He was very lucky in Q1, and he's yet again very lucky in Q2. And Ferrari, they've been saved a little bit. A, a, a little bit. Again, you can't really blame a for going out of that session. Not in his control in the slightest. Just one of those things which happened. But now it's down to Dylan Warren's side of the, uh, of the team to really try and get something together here for a driver who, again, you know, talks himself down a little bit. I've not had much practice. I'm not going to be very quick. I'm going out in Q1. He's made it to Q3. The floor's all his. He's yeah. got nothing left to lose now. Of course. So we'll see what they can do here in the end of this um, part of qualifying. And it will be Jack West who goes out first 
onto circuit, of course, in the McLaren, part of the Veloce Academy team. We'll see what he can manage to do here in Q3. Maybe it could be a fight for pole here for Jack West, as we can see as well there. That will be Joris Crozen heading out onto circuit in the the race clutch Alpine. We'll see what he can do here in Q3. Nice to see Joris making his way through into all this final part of the qualifying session. And then just behind as well, his teammate, uh, Sergio Sabrina, will also be heading out onto circuit. Sergio was third in that Q2 session, Josh. So he's looking he's looking quite um, solid, isn't he, here, Sergio? Yeah, we've seen it before, though, haven't we? When it comes to Q2, Sergio's able to pull out a lap. When it comes to Q3, a mistake starts to creep in. He's just got to keep his head yeah. level. Mm -hmm. That's it. You, you, race culture had a brilliant opportunity here to score a great handful of points. Both drivers through. They've just got to take it easy. They've yep. got to keep the head. The Loche Academy, a very similar thing. You've Ooh, just got back. to keep your head. It's good to see Ishman Puki's joined. Hopefully he's got the uh, Allen key out to fix his pedals. <laughs> um, but no, end of the day. Loche Academy, race clutch. There are teams here we're going to have to keep a very close eye on. Both of yep. them getting both of their drivers through. The rest of them only have one driver. We know teamwork around Qatar can make dream work. Of it sounds corny. It's cringy. We know. But with a, a track so difficult to overtake and DRS trains so prominent, being around your teammate can go so far into this race. Of course. And I think the key thing here to note for Race Clutch is that their gap to P4, being RHG, is five points. Their gap then to Ferrari is 11 points. So they're only... They only need to outscore Ferrari and RHG by 12 points, and they're up into fourth. Thir sorry, yeah. third in the standing. Sorry, third, third, yes. And then they're only another 20 points back from F7R. So, race clutch, this race will matter a lot for them, I think, more than many people realise. Obviously, then next week we have Imola, and then straight after that we have Mexico, pretty much. So, the good thing for a team like race clutch is they've got many drivers to use. So, they can now make some others focus on Imola, make some others focus on Mexico, while these two, Joris and Sergio have put everything into Qatar. Yeah, it really... Just having that in-depth talent roster that Race Clutch have, they can really, you know, splash out with which drivers do what. They can split up uh, and sort of balance out how it's all going to work lineup-wise, plan that all out well in advance. And then you take almost, uh, you know, an opposite to that with a couple of these other teams having slightly thinner rosters, not necessarily, you know, packing out the amount of talent that the likes of a Race Clutch or a Ferrari or a Williams would have, you know? Those drivers are going to be exhausted come the end of this. They're going to need that break week, to say the very least, because they will be sweating this game yeah. relentlessly. I mean, it goes without saying, earlier today, went on Steam, had a little look, all the drivers on my friends list, all it said, multiplayer, Qatar, all of them practicing with their teammates, trying to figure out what was best, getting those laps in, making sure they're dialed into the session. Yaris is going to be the first one to set a lap time here in Q3. Where's he going to be able to put up? Well, it was Jack before Yoris, Josh. He got a little bit carried oh, away with himself, and Yoris oh, there no. coming out of the final corner. Big slide there from the Alpine. I caught it perfectly on my cameras. He will cross the line. It won't be a very good lap for him. It will be a 20.685. Then we have one of the F7Rs coming through to start a lap. We have um, Sergio Sabrino heading through in towards turn number 13 and 14 now. We'll see what can the other race switch guy do. Currently, obviously, it's a provisional pole here for Jack West. It's Provisional front row for Yoris and Sergio oh. invalidates, so that's his lap done and dusted. What can Dylan Warren do? A 26.3 in that first sector. I think that's a tenth quicker or so than what Yoris did. I'm not sure about Jack. So we'll see here what Dylan could do in this middle sector so far. Yeah, it's certainly... Never mind. Right, invalidate. Okay, yeah. right. Let's let's just right. agree. We're Tucker not going to show any next. drivers. <laughs> no, 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 we don't. We're not showing any more drivers. We're just going to show the gravel. Can't hurt <laughs> anyone. Right. Tycho Hardy, we mentioned Dark Horse in these qualifying sessions. Phenomenal pace uh, during the qualifying trip. Able to translate it perfectly over into race pace. Is this going to be another miracle masterclass from Tycho Hardy here today? Couple corners left to go in this first Q1 out in. Yeah. For me, he's going to be my prediction for pole. Well, that's, that's a bold one, Josh. I don't know who I'm predicting for pole. Um, I'm going to go with... You know what? I'll go with um, Team Zelenkovic because I think MVR, de uh, MVR deserve it. But, of course, guys, let us know in the chat who you think will take pole position here tonight in E-Series. There's 10 drivers all fighting for it, 10 of them all looking to try and get the best lap time possible. So make sure whether you're in YouTube or Twitch to let us know who you think will take that top spot. As we can see, Tiger Hardy to the top, an 80, uh, a 19.8. What a lap time there. He's the GOAT, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's for prediction. Gain of an extra what can Declan do, though? Declan's looking to be a little bit quicker, I think, on this lap. Can he try and take pole away provisionally? 
Yes, he can. By nearly half yes. a tenth there, an eight five zero. What can Nordyke do? Can he take it away? Yes, he can. A point seven nine zero. So the lap times are all flooding through. Oh, what mate. can Zelenkovic do? Nothing, because he's invalidated. What can Sabrino do? He's invalidated. What about Ishmael Fassi? Can he try Double and take purple. pole away in this session? Ishmael Fassi up to the line. What will it be for the Williams? Up to the top. Oh. So we've had four drivers all take provisional pole. A point seven 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 there for Ishmael Fassi. Brilliant there from the Williams oh. driver. Yeah, double purple. I then finished it off with a green. Only a small bit away. Max Wiesel could across the line there with an 18-7. Invalidated, but still would have been, you know, up there. An 18-7? 18-7. That, that'd be a I, second I quicker, Josh. I, I think I misread that. <laughs> I think that was a 19-7. It's been a long day, okay? It's okay. Yeah. If he's on a 19-7, uh, no. we need to check his PC, I think. I, I feel like we need to check more than his PC at that point. I feel like we need to check him for sort of robotic parts. Um, <laughs> you know, you're supposed to you're supposed to get slow of uh, age, uh, a little bit of wear and tear. Terminator, I'm telling you, keep an eye wear out for him. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, ten years time, he'll still be here, still be doing it as as he describes it, just a hobby. Yeah, I love how we just say that, just a hobby. All the others are there. You know, making this some sort of trying to make it some sort of career, and some of them making it, of course, a career and. Max Lewis was like, yeah, you know, I did this just for a little bit of fun here and there. <laughs> it, it's, it's, yeah. It's a quiet Friday night activity, hopping into E series, putting in a great lap time, calling it a day. Literally like Max Verstappen, isn't it? Pretty much. Genuinely. I wonder if he has a part time gig for um, Formula One racing. Max yeah. Wiesel. It he might make to, sense. He used to have a full time gig for, I think it was a four, I think it was Formula Ford or something, or Formula BMW back in, I think it was 2007. And from what um, from what I heard, I don't know if it was true, but he did beat Sergio Perez in a race. That's not hard. Oh, well, there we are. <laughs> you know, we, we no. could say he's beaten a Red Bull driver, five-time Formula One winner, but no, we'll ignore that part. No. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's it's what you expect when it comes to a series, haven't you? All these drivers, uh, you know, there's there's been a big discussion how you know sim racing can be a leeway to professional racing uh, and you know it's it's quite often we end up seeing the reverse of it max beetle's a great example and then of course you know like see yana me being a great example as well, well go from real racing to sim racing i've got another example but i don't know his name so that's what i'm just going to say the nascar guy oh the nascar guy yes the the american who went from being an eye racing to now being i think he's a winner as well in nascar i know if tom's in here he'll tell me because he's um he told me to watch nascar but i forgot his name already um but yeah i'm sure oh. that he's um, a, a nascar winner as well and he started out on our racing and of course my brilliant um career in sim racing started of course being one of the best in f1 and now i race of course over in the real life formula 2 don't i josh yeah i, I heard you was actually uh, destined to make a Hmm? You cut out at the wrong time. Josh? Yes, hello? You cut out at the wrong time. You said you're destined uh, yeah. to met and then stopped. Yeah, I, I, I heard a rumor you was destined to hop into the real F1 seat and uh, take Logan Sargent's car away from him for the second race running. Yeah, and that is you cancelled for dis, um, saying that confidential information. Brilliant, Josh. Well done. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Well, if anyone had a bookies bet on, uh, you might need to go check with Tonali just to make sure it's all right. <laughs> Um, but no, look at here, Tiger Hardy, first out of the pit lane, two minutes 40 left in the session, he's got time to prep his lap, he's got time to burn off a little bit of excess fuel. Yeah, of course. But would you really want to do that? Would you want to go take that extra lap to prepare? Because the tyres around here are so crucial for your lap time. I don't think he's got time to go twice, he's only got two minutes and 20 to go. So I think he's just going to go out early and get that lap time sorted and done. And dusted. So yet again, guys, let us know in the chat who you think will take pole position here tonight. So I can see you there. Oscar's saying Tycho is on is he, is on in the same form. So to me, that means he's going to take pole um, from Oscar's point of view. But make sure, guys, to get your predictions in as well. And we'll get um, underway with, the, with these final Q3 laps very, very shortly. Josh said Tiger Hardy. I'm going to say, as I said before, Tima Zelenkovic will take pole. And that's who I'm guessing. And I saw in the chat there, Dude Bob says, uh, isn't Josie Floke in F3 as well? He is. And yeah. don't worry, I'm not actually in F2 because you added it as well as in you believe I'm in F2. I'm not. Um, no. He's, no he's, he's far from F2. Oh, and a penalty. That is Tiger Hardy going to be starting from fifth or fifth at least. No. It's sandbagging. Sandbagging. <laughs> sandbagging for the lobby restart. Of course, those penalties don't matter. Don't need to worry about it. Tycho, 
does need to worry about is Lapo. Yep. He's yes. got very, very quick drivers behind him. He's in a prime position to kind of hold him up a little bit. You know, back it up, try and force this train into a bit of an awkward scenario. He's got that luxury. Yeah. But I don't think the last thing Tycho's going to want is a car to bolt past him. So I, it wouldn't surprise me if he ends up bolting it, coming out of this triple right-hander here and trying to get sorted with his lap as soon as possible. Well, we'll see what Tycho could do on this um, final run here in Q3. Currently on a 119.892 in the S7R Alpha Terry, but he's got another a minute and 20 seconds to go around this circuit as he heads his way through into the final couple of corners there. And I can see in the chat as well, Otis says he's expecting Tycho to be on pole because he's been practicing since Sunday. Well, I don't agree with that because he was in PSG on Thursday in Portimao. So no, you, you've been debunked there, Otis. But we'll see here what Tycho can do. Heading into turn one here, Josh, he's looking to get the best lap time possible. He needs to gain time main, mainly in that first sector, a big slide. That's not going to help him. No, it's not going to be ideal. But again, it all depends on how well he's able to handle that second sector as well. A lot of his time can be found and reclaimed throughout that second sector. We'll just keep an eye on the sector splits here. Keep you informed of who's going purple where and who's doing what. Tiger Hardy not finding improvement out of that first sector. It's down to that slide out of turn one, as you correctly pointed out. But he's not the only one. Jos Nordijk behind him can't find an improvement in sector one. A lot of these drivers picking up a couple struggles here and there. We've got uh, Jack West... Uh, picking up an invalidation already on his lap. That's not, it's not, it's not good for the A driver. Definitely not, because Jack's down in P5 on a 20.2. That's not competitive at all compared to what we get at the end of Q3. We can see Tiger Hardy still down on his time in that second sector. So can he find anything in the final sector? Pretty much two corners in sector three. What can Tiger Hardy do as he heads down into turn number 16? He's got a peak here if he wants to have any chance of trying to fight for pole position. He goes wide a little bit on the exit. He opens the DRS now up towards the line. What will it be for Tiger Hardy? Will it be pole position? It will be up and he stays in P4 then. Then we've got Jost Nordijk up to the line. Can he take pole away? Yes, he can. A point seven five three. We've still got many drivers coming through up towards the line there. We've got Declan Barrett heading up to the line. What can he do? He goes up and stays third, but he does improve on his lap time. But Ishmael Fazi here, Josh, is up by just over a tenth of a second here in that middle sector. Yeah, he's looking absolutely solid so far for Ishmael. I've found a lot of time in that first sector. He's going to approach up towards the line now. And his provisional pole so far. Team is like and Dylan Warren still to go. Are they able to pull out any miracles? I don't think they did. I think no. Ishmael, he's got it. But Dylan Warren, P5. Yeah, very nice there from Dylan Warren into P5. But his teammate, of course, this one, Puka, did get his way back in. So he will be starting 15th. But we can see the final classification here of qualifying. It's going to be Ishmael Fassi on pole position for Williams ahead of Joost Nordijk for the RHG team in second. Only 40,000 separating those two. And then it will be Declan Barrett in third for Veloce Academy. Max Wiesel fourth for TF10. Then we have Dylan Warren in P5. Tiger Hardy in P6. Followed by Tima Zlegovic in seventh. Eighth position for Joris Kroos. And ninth for Jack West and Sergio Sereno. Not getting a lap time in there. Big shame for the Alpine driver. Yeah. I mean, we mentioned it before. Q2 showed a great form. Just need to keep a level head. Unfortunately, unable to do so. Couldn't get a lap time on the board. But knowing they've got the pace to battle up towards that front five, that front six... Going to be interesting, going to be one to keep an eye out throughout the rest of this race. Of course, and you can see it's now on your screen. So we're back again now for the intermission break between the um, the qualifying and the race. So we'll have a quick word from our sponsors over at GT Omega and Sim Racing Centre, and we'll be back with you very, okay. very shortly.
We're on the wrong screen and we're muted. But we're back. Uh, welcome back, everyone, here to E Series now, round seven, Qatar. We're getting ready to get in towards the race. And until we do that, and I've just knocked everything over, until we do that, we need to get ourselves back into the session, get everyone sorted out, get, ev uh, get the grid jotted down and make sure everyone's in their correct positions. And then we can launch the session and get underway for a 29 lap race around this circuit. So this could be very, very interesting. It can be, you know, there's, there's really two ways this can go, right? There's a way chat wants it to go, where it can be a little bit of carnage, you know, uh, an absolute there for a couple of these drivers, absolutely havoc breaks loose, safety car, and then there's a way that a lot of the drivers are going to want, want it to go. Uh, from an entertainment point, it'll be very stand standoffish, very boring, everyone saving up their battery for the last couple laps, battery dumping right at the end, mm -hmm. and just having a very sensible race. Which 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 sort of line are you sitting on at the minute? Um, go all out and see what happens. Oh, That's what I, like I think gonna we should to, do. I feel like I'm going to have to agree. I feel like we should have a couple of people starting on the wets, a couple of people <laughs> starting on the softs, a couple of people going and nicking Michelins from the, the WEC cars. <laughs> Why not? Slap them all together. Give it a run. Well, it'd be certainly quite interesting. I don't know if it'd be um, um, very entertain entertaining for the drivers. Because using no. wets on a dry circuit, which is also very hot, would not be very ideal at all. You'd see um, rubber just being left on the track burning um, on the circuit, which then would make it very slippery and turn it into Mario Kart. But, of course, the team to talk about, SRC, Doug and Hoffman, yes. Louis Welch, 16th and 17th. That was not a good day in the office at all for the SRC team, but now they can recuperate. 29 laps to go, of course, in this race. So they've got a lot of work to do, but the question is, can they do the work when it's just a long DRS train? It's going to be a challenge, to say the very least. That's putting it in the most mild sense. It's going to be incredibly difficult to navigate their way through the traffic. It's going to be uh, very, very difficult to make sure that once they end up making a move, they're able to hold on to it. And, um, you know, it, it all comes back to how well are they able to work together on track together. Mm -hmm. You know, if one car ends up making an overtaking opportunity, will the other car directly try and follow through? Are they willing to take that risk, or are they going to kind of sell it down a little bit and think, right, there's an opportunity for here to pick up a couple places, yeah. go for an undercut, hold on in a DRS train. Might be easier. That could be the way to go. Again, it'll be awesome to hear from our engineering team, of course. Tymon, one of the lovely commentators here from PSGL, is engineering them, I do believe, today. So mm -hmm. maybe if he puts anything in chat, he can give us a little heads up to what's happening. Safety yeah. car wise, they would love one. Yes. Well, bring them right back in. Depends on the strategy they, they take, though. If they take something like a soft at the start and move up, and then the safety car comes out, brilliant. But if they stay on, if they start on the traditional traditional strategy, and the safety car comes out, it does nothing for them really. It just keeps them down in that position. And we've got a, um, a question in the chat saying, "Who has the best trim on the grid, lads?" I don't have a clue. But, um, I'm trying to think of someone that has an outrageous, um, outrageous different extraordinary trim, but I don't think anyone does. I think they all have the standard haircut. Um, no, oh. Got, oh, Franek has got long hair and it actually suits him. Yeah. Franek moravec has got the best trim on the grid. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Everyone else has either got very short hair or... No, everyone, I, no I think I everyone's feel, got I hair. I think Max but... Wiesel. Why? He's just got a normal trim. Yeah. It looks but like it suits boring. him. Looks with, old. with a beard as well. <laughs> that is uncalled for. <laughs> so uncalled. No, su suits him. Looks like a, a strong man who's ready to take a win here tonight in his series with that oh, trim. That's what I reckon. Possible. We'll see what he could do. Um, you know, he, he's of course on Wikipedia the oldest ever PSGL PCF1 winner back in Spain. So, you know, he's proven before he can be the best and Starting from fourth, he's got a lot of work to do. But the question is, can he do it? I think he can. But he's got very competitive drivers ahead. He's got Yost ahead of him. He's got um, Ishmael Fassi on pole, of course. Those are two drivers you don't really want to get involved with because the sense, you know, of how quick they are. They're very quick drivers. Their strategies also are always on par. So, I, you know, I, I can't go past Ishmael not winning this and Yost battling for second because they're just that good at this point. And so far in qualifying, they've proven it. Yeah, I mean, it's, when it comes to the grid, where we've got the talent as we do here at E-Series, you know, we, we say similar things about the F2 and the F3 grid, yeah. respectively. But when they're competing as a team 
against other teams, it adds a whole different dynamic. And that's where you really see these drivers, you know, racing IQ shine through. They're not just thinking for themselves, they're thinking for the team, they're thinking for a strategy for it. You know, they're all working together in a whole cohesive unit. And I feel like that's where some of these teams really shine through. Yeah. The likes of RHG, for example, example right? Mm-hmm. Think back to Austria. How on earth was able to make that work? Thomas yeah. Ronard going from back of a field all the way through, grabbing himself uh, that one two finish mm-hmm. by working with his teammate, yeah. saving fuel throughout that entire last stint. It really just comes into hand at making sure that both your drivers have a good connection between each other. Engineering team is there to monitor what's going on conversation wise, make sure everyone's filled in, there's no blanks left. It can be a whole different ball game when it comes to these team championships, yeah. but we can clearly see a lot of these teams. Uh, they've got it they've got it sorted out at this point. Of course. And well, SRC I suppose they can work together though, because you know, that they're, they're, de- they're down together at the back, they can try and push together. But the issue they have is is, a, is if a safety car comes out, they're both gonna have to pick probably. Which then puts you in a situation of one of them's gonna be a little bit further back and might drop a few positions. So that's the only issue they have with being together, of course. But looking through at the teams, obviously Williams, they're not close together at all. Obviously first for Ishmael yeah. Fassi, eleventh for um Keen Godendort, then RHG have got Yost in second, Tamash Jane in P12, so they've also can't really work together too much. Um, TF10, they've got is it Max in fourth and Joel's in the top ten. I think he was around ninth, wasn't he? So they're they can work together a little yeah. bit, can't they? Yeah. I mean ultimately it's it's gonna come down to having that cross team dynamic between the drivers. You know, they don't really want to help their rivals out. Let's let's be frank. Mm-hmm. You, don't re- you don't really want to do that, but they will have to in the DRS train. Yeah, pretty it's much. It's just the way it is. You have no but at the back of their mind, back of their mind, they're always thinking, right, if I squeeze someone after getting this DRS overtake, mm-hmm. could my teammates sneak past? Could I actually have a person I want behind me, behind me, where I can feel secure holding onto this position, recharge a little bit of battery, and then go again on the attack? Um, you know, it was all different sort of, sorts of tactics and, and theories that they can use to really try and get themselves an upper, upper edge on this. But we do have a, a couple of compliments in chat. <laughs> uh, we've got Iggy calling you Peter Griffin, which, in my opinion, compliment. Funny. Well, you we can take think that. Of that way. I've been called Nugget right, okay. Richards. I've been called Leng. I've been called Otis's Pookie Bear. Iggy's putting loads of red... Because on, because I'm using the restream chat, it says face red heart shape. <laughs> so it's it's a, a little red heart looking upwards with a blue hand <laughs> praising you. It's the funniest Richard us. Well, I'll tell you. Yeah, it's I saw a vi- vile squirrel put Nathaniel's my go. I don't know who vile squirrel is, and it must be someone I know because they wouldn't be called. You know, they wouldn't put Nathaniel's because know. I don't know. If, the if only you people know, you know that is people in Max Cross Porter server or the tw- was it the twenty four hours of F one. Was, yes. wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Where I went completely off the rails at 12 o'clock at night and started just calling you the <laughs> funniest Richard us. Yep, and we remember that why. God picture. No, was we it the God picture? And then, of course, the picture with Elsa. But, Josh, enough of waffling about my beautiful face. We've got a yes. lap, uh, race again underway. 29 laps. So, long one. A long one to Josh. How... <sighs> I'm just interested to see what we're going to be able to do, right? When it comes to that DRS window, once it opens, I just want to see it. I don't, I don't want to sit here waffling for ages. Don't want to start pancaking. Don't want to start making crepes. I just want to get into the action at this point. But they've got to take their time, adjust their strategies, adjust their setups, get themselves back in to that zone where they're going to be able to take, you know, every bit of confidence they would have gained from that qualifying session, from a practice, and really make it count. Because of course, this is where the points are made. Yeah, well, I don't think you can make the points anywhere else, Josh. So if you can, well done. Well, fair play to him. But of course, we do have the five red lights coming up right at the top of your screen. And it's lights out. And away we go here. We've got Ishmael Fassi there having a pretty decent start over on that racing line side of a grid. On that hard compound tyre doing exactly what he to do for the start of this race. Your Josh Nordijk, Max Wiesel and Declan Barrett all on the mediums trying to follow him through hot on at their heels but they're having a bit of a squabble between themselves Ooh. we look further down the grid we've got more hard compound runners who are going to be looking to try and latch themselves within the DRS we're getting jostling for positions everywhere and Duncan Hoffland is one of those drivers jostling for those positions on that soft compound tyre really trying to make up places left right and centre we've got cars going two three wide coming out at turn five it's brilliant we've got Jack West there trying to make a very late lunge to the inside of Tycho Hardy Tycho Hardy's falling down the order here drastically at the start of this race 
Yeah, you're trying to look for something, but everyone's battling everywhere for every position. We can see Istan Puka there making a move into P12 ahead of Sabrina. We can see uh, Lindhart into P14. We can see as well Duncan Hoffland. Brilliant start now into the top 10 after one lap or at least half a lap here around the Qatar. So he's looking to try and score even more points for the SRC team. Louis Welch, though, poor start for him. He's only in P18 at the moment, losing positions to two of the hard runners being um, Louis Valentin and Franek Moraviak. So he will head through in 18th and now... Under pressure, he's got damage, I think. Yes, he has. Yes, he has on the front. Um, his front left end plate is gone. So that means Louis Welch will probably be entering back into the pit lane here. So a poor start there for SRC Louis Welch. As Duncan Hoffman, though, has had a very good start. And Jono Trepkov also following, in it, following him in. So he must have also made a bit of a mistake. Now, further ahead, we can see Tamash Gull here looking to make a move into P8 ahead of Joris Krozen. Gets C in side line. Breaks later. Move done for Tamash. Into P8 he goes. And Joris there. Bit of a tap from Duncan Hoffman, wasn't it, there into turn one? Yeah, Duncan just getting that little squeeze through there. Just on the inside. Brilliant stuff from Duncan on that soft compound tyre. He's doing exactly what he needs to do. Disrupt the flow of these other racers. Use that soft compound tyre to your advantage. Make the positions while you can because those soft tyres won't last forever. When those mediums and those hards end up getting towards that stage of a race where they'll end up being better tyres, they'll offer more grip. He's going to feel like an absolute sitting duck in that Aston Martin car. But showing right Ooh. now, he's more than happy to go and try and make a couple of these moves. We said turn one and turn ten with a real overtaking opportunities around this circuit. Duncan Hoffland said, you know what, Josh, Nathan, shut up. I don't want to hear any more from you. I'm going to make my own overtaking opportunities. Scorched him himself all the way up into P7. I'm excited to see how much further he's going to be able to go on this soft compound tyre. Yeah, we'll see what he can, uh, can do because so far he's really quick on those soft tyres. We can see that gap there just four and a half tenths to... Jack Quest, I'm on board here with this Van Puka looking to make a move ahead. Uh, Tamas Galt to get himself into P9. He goes to the inside here of the R8G Sabre. To the inside he goes, gets a move done. Ooh. Pushing Tamash off the track a little bit there. That's going to be controversial afterwards. So we'll see what happens with that one. And Tamash now looking to try and fight back, but can't do so as they head back down to turn one. So it's Ishmael Fassi who leads on a set of the hards. That is very good here for Ishmael because he can go to a set of the mediums to the end of the others. Probably onto a set of hard tyres. So Ishmael, what a strategy this could be here for him. Yeah, it could absolutely be a blinder of a strategy for him. But of course, Jos Nord, like uh, Max Wiesel, Declan Barrett, Dylan Moran and Jack West all on that medium compound tyre. They're going to be waiting, just hoping for an opportunity for a safety car to come up during the start of this first stint where they'll be able to dive it over to potentially, uh, you know, that set of hards that little bit earlier, guarantee themselves a slightly earlier pit stop and really put Ishmael Fassi in a tight situation where he would stay out on the hard compound tyre or whether he would try and stretch mediums on that second stint a little bit longer than he would like. But of course, all of that can change. We're still yet to see the drivers really burn a bit of a battery trying to get a couple moves done. So we can expect these drivers in this DRS train just to hold the positions for now wait for an opportunity to come towards them they're not looking to make that move they're not necessarily looking and going on the hunt for them they're waiting for a mistake from the driver in front and then that's when they'll use the battery that's when they'll use the drs all the way down in turn one and get that move sorted they're just gonna have to be very very patient and very controlled with how they race the rest of this first stint of course and we'll see here what duncan hoff can do there looking to gain into the back of jack west but made a mistake on the exit of the final corner so he loses time there on the rear of the uh, Village Academy driver. We can see further back as well. This one, Pukki in there, looking to close in and make a move, possibly, on the back of Tiger Hardy for P9. We can see further back as well. Moves being made. This is Keen Godendorp looking to make a move ahead of Sixton Linhart, who's looking to make a move ahead of Sergio Sabrino. Keen goes wide, tries to get back up the inside of Sixton, but can't quite do so there. So Sixton's still looking strong here in P14 so far. Sergio as well also looking to try and defend here from the MVR car behind. MVR having a bit of a better race here tonight in East. It was P12 and P14 so far for the Haas team and further back of course TES with another dismal start. P16 and P19 for those two and obviously Yano Trepkov has been in the pit lane and already made a pit stop due to damage I believe on lap one. Obviously he had, must have had contact with Louis Welch and Joel Marquard so we'll see what he can do and if he can try and recover from that position but still we can see Tycho Hardy here getting ever so closer to the back of Tycho Hardy yes Ishan Puki certainly looking to try and get a move done sooner rather than later on that soft compound tyre but I will give you a silver lining here for the TS driver for Franek Marawiak he's still with the DRS 
that is absolutely crucial around the track. I know we mentioned it before in qualifying, but if you fall out of a window of DRS, it can be so difficult to catch back up. We mentioned it might not be the reason why overcuts, undercuts, might not necessarily work as strong around the circuit in comparison to others. It's purely because of the slipstream. The DRS here is so crucial for these drivers. You can already see Yom Arquad not finding himself in that optimal position. Doesn't have a DRS. He's falling slightly further off the back of Louis Valentin. Yane Tripkov on that fresh medium combat attire doesn't seem to be able to find the pace on this DRS train we've currently got stretching all the way from uh, P1 down to P17. I expect to see this level of close racing throughout the rest of his first stint. As soon as those pit stops are made, that's where we can start seeing those gaps open up and different strategies come into play with different drivers using different battery deployments all throughout their certain parts of the track where they feel like they're going to find the best overtaking opportunity. But I say Ishtan Puki's on a tear. Tamash Gal is still right on his tail. Yeah, we'll see if Tamashi can try and get past the back of the Ferrari and get himself up into P9 and get himself ever so closer to his teammate who obviously leads this race now, ahead of Ishmael Fassi, ahead of Max Vietzel in third in the um, in the TF10 Red Bull. So we'll see if he can try and take that win away. We've got contact. That's Moraviak out. That's going to be a safety car here, I think, in this oh. session. Is it or is it not? Because we're not no. getting a... Oh, no safety car. So because is it because of how far off track he is? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's because he's so far off track. Uh, it didn't necessarily warrant a warning, but uh, I do feel awful for that commentator curse. I knew I was going to end up having one today. Didn't think it would be to front at Morawiak. <laughs> I apologise. <laughs> TS, yeah, I hold my hands up. That one's on me. I am so sorry. So TS are going to score at this point, unless there's a safety car. Um, what? Two points. Yep. Ooh, this is not good at all for TS, is it? Just going from bad to worse. It seems every race, as we can see. Kian Gordon up there, making move ahead of Six and Lintart into P14 goes the Williams driver. He also would like to be a little bit closer if he can to the leaders. Obviously, Luby Valentin, big shame for him as well. Obviously, part of the S7R team, second in the championship. Now, Danny P16 and barely within that one second train. Now, I think he might just about get within it as they head through towards that next section. Yeah, I mean, look at here, we've seen the likes of Dungan Hofland, uh, Ishvan Puki making moves all the way up throughout the field. But of course, Drivers move up, some have to move down. Unfortunately for Race Clutch, both of their drivers losing three positions each. Yoris find himself back in P11, Sergio all the way back in P13. With the pace they've shown in qualifying, we know they can get up there. We know they can battle for that top six sort of region on track. It's just how difficult it is to get close racing within a DRS train. Of course, it's a tool meant to try and help them get overtakes, but at the end of the day, when it gets to these sort of scenarios, it can almost be a detriment to the racing we can get. I know we had a conversation about this before. Why don't they just make the car slower? It might make for some, you know, better racing. So, my thought process, we just remove one of the tyres from all the cars. Well, um, hmm. Would it work? Probably not. No, you no, it try wouldn't. You try it, Josh. Hopefully you don't try it. No, I, I, I don't feel like I'm in a position to try it. Unlike Tycho Hardy, who's had a fantastic run out that final corner on Duncan Hoffman, you can see him just swimming all over the back. But tucking back in, showing Duncan Hoffman, he's not a threat. He's more than happy to sit behind Duncan at the minute, despite being able to get a better run out of that third sector, showing those soft tyres might be coming towards the end of their life, to that cliff, uh, to that cliff point where they're going to start dropping dramatically in performance for the next couple of laps before they can kind of get resuscitated back to a, a somewhat of a neutral pace, which, of course, would still make the mediums and hards slightly quicker than the softs at that point. Yeah, they don't exactly look like the strongest tie at this current point, you know, um... You know, for a second, both Duncan and this one um, dropped back. But as the trainers got through, they've also gained now. So the gap's only three tenths between Hofland and West. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what Duncan can do here. Maybe try and get himself any uh, any more positions high before making his pit stop. He won't pit nowhere near yet because you can't run a long time at all around this circuit on your tyres. So we'll probably wait till around lap 10 and lap 11 maybe before going on to hards. Unless he wants to go long and pit around lap 15 onto a set of mediums. So, it, you know, it's going to be... Uh, a bit of a weird one here, a bit of an odd strategy for Duncan Hofton to get underway with him. We've got word in the chat there, Franek says his beautiful wheel disconnected. So, big show there for Franek to have a wheel disconnect and, well, definitely not make TS's day any close to good at all. So, hopefully for next week he can get it sorted out and be back at full form once again. But we can see Isvan Puki once again looking to gain in here and make a move for P8. But just nowhere near close enough we can see, of course, further ahead there. Max Wiesel now looking to close in to the rear of Ishmael Fassi, but also they're not really even keen to make a move. No, and just to point out how potent that DRS slipstream combination is, Ishmael Fassi got a worse run out of that final corner on that hard compound tire, and he was still able to catch up six tenths of a second down that straight alone with the help of the slipstream DRS, not even deploying any battery. 
that's how strong it is around here. It's pivotal that these drivers are able to keep within it. You do have to feel sorry for the likes of John Marco, Diane Tripkov, and Louis Welsh. You don't have any sort of DRS to aid them in their struggle to climb back up here. They'll be continuing this race, trying to score some points, just hoping for a safety car so they can really try and battle for some more points than what they're currently looking at at the moment. Of course, as we can see further down the field, Joel Marquardt, I believe, has made another mistake because he's dropped back to P17. So is he the one who got caught up with Franek, maybe? I'm not sure because, yeah, he's dropped a lot of time. He was originally just about on the, you know, just about on the touch of the front, I think. He's now all the way down, 11 seconds back off of it. We can see, of course, further behind, Louis and Jarne still looking just to try and get something to it. Just looking to try and get closer to that front train, but still going to be under a lot of pressure when it comes towards the end of that race. And... Well, they've just got to try and battle between each other, I think, haven't they here, Josh? You know, 18th and 19th, 21 seconds off, 32 seconds off the main train. I can't really see them making positions no. unless there's a safety car. I don't think it's even possible. They could try DRS training, but at the end of the day, it might not be enough. Something I uh, do want to point out as well. Viewers at home, you can keep a very close eye whenever we're in that DRS train to see who is trying to save a little bit of tyre, who's trying to save a little bit more battery in comparison to the rest of them, because they all shut their DRS again when it comes uh, to around the halfway point of a straight. Ishmael Fassi, guilty at that time, shut the DRS, making sure he didn't get the overspeed on your Snord bike because he doesn't want to lead. He doesn't want to be the one breaking that air in front. Yes, it will help the engine cool, but at the same time, it's not going to be beneficial heading back down the straight next time, and he'll have to burn a little bit of battery to keep ahead of the rest of the guys. So, for now, he's more than happy sitting in P2, keeping the DRS shut, not necessarily losing too much time on that hard compound tyre. I'm sure he's just waiting for that moment for those mediums to drop off, but it does seem like a little bit of a way away at this moment. Of course, as we can see there, a move for P18. Louis Welch now up ahead of Jano Tripkov down at the back of the field. So they're now making some trades for position. We can see further ahead now, Max Visa looking to just try and edge closer here to the rear of Ishmael Fassi, who I still think is on the best strategy here. Obviously, being on the hards now, all these on the mediums. Oh, a bit of a dummy pit stop there from Declan out there. Just looking like he was going to pit to maybe try and trick someone behind. I don't think you'd pit this early anyway, you know, on lap nine. There'd be no point pitting this early. You'd be very slow. By the end, so we'll see them all once again head down to turn one. A little bit like watching, you know, checkers on a chessboard, just all diagonals. They head down to turn one, all spread out. No one really making moves at all. It's Manfassi there closing in to the rear of Nordreich, but yet again, not making a move. They're all just going to be following each other. So this is the way you have the boring go and get a drink and grab something to eat and come back phase, isn't it, Josh? Yeah, it's it's the uh, waiting, it's the loading screen, let's say. Beautiful artwork, getting to watch these cars follow each other so closely. But at the end of the day, you're still waiting for that bar to finish loading, and that'll be when they all come into the pits for their opportunity to get out a fresh set of tyres on and make the time count on that fresh set of tyres. So, a minute, take it easy. If you want to go grab a drink, make yourself a coffee, do so. If you missed something absolutely drastic, it was all Nathan Richards' fault. It was his idea to send you away. But... You will want to keep an eye for that pit stop window and when it's going to happen. You can expect Duncan Hoffman oh, and Ishmael Buki to be a couple of the first drivers to dive it in. But Max there, did Ishmael have a little bit of a mistake there? Or did Max no. just have so much overspeed? Max was using his ERS. He was actually trying to make a move on the back of Ishmael, but Ishmael moved oh. to the inside. So Max was looking to make an overtake there, but no, still sitting behind the back of Fassi. So he's looking to get closer and trying to, you, you know, use a bit more of those medium tyres that's strapped onto the back of his Red Bull we can see them now head out of the final corner Matt down towards turn number one and we'll see if any moves can be made most likely not unless someone makes a big mistake out of the final corner but no they all follow down towards turn one first down to 16th now in this trend and Louis Van Tien getting back within that one second brilliant for him to now be considered back part of this race if you're not in the DRS train you're not really involved in the race at this point because of how much you lose um, compared to those in the DRS. And we can see, of course, further back, Duncan Hoffman, Denis Van Pukie making their strategies, strategies work heavily. So 16th to 7th for um, Duncan. And it's going to be 15th to 9th for Isvan. And they can stick with this train until they, all the others on the medium is pit. Yeah, I mean, realistically, you know, if you're like Tamash Gal, like a Hardy behind the soft compound runners, you know, you, uh, you don't want to push them for an overtake in that second sector. Because at the end of the day, it could potentially risk you losing the DRS to the cars in front. So for them, it's going to be very infuriating seeing the back of that soft compound tyre. No, they've got the pace to overtake. No, they've got the pace to hold on to the back of them uh, and really try and make a challenge through sector two, through sector one. Um, maybe not through sector three, given how just the track layout is. But no, they've got that potential, but they're not 
able to pull the trigger on making that overtake because they're concerned about missing out on DRS to the cars in front. That's why they're sort of sitting here at this moment in time, waiting, as we are seeing a couple di uh, drivers dive into the pits. Jack West, Duncan Hoffman, Ishvan Puki, and Tamash Gal all into the pits on lap 10. Yeah, very early pit stops here. Obviously, for those on the soft, it's not really, but those on the mediums, very early to make a pit stop in this race. So, so early. So, I believe it will be hard tyres for Jack, Tamash, and Sixton, and I presume hard for the others as well. It will be uh, yes. hard for all as they en enter into the pit lane. And... Now it's going to be Justin or not that leads ahead of Ishmael ahead of Max still. And then we can see the likes of Tiger Hardy now into the P6. We've got Zelenkovic into P8, Sabrino into P9, and Keen Gund up in the top 10. But they also need to make a pit stop now in this race, and we'll see what that can do. And now, do we see the likes of the TF10 car here, John Marco, trying and hold them up to help Max, possibly? Potentially. It's, it's a lot to ask of Joel on a 11 lap old hard tyres to. Uh, really be on nail in the coffin for these drivers who have decided to pit but they have all done it at the correct time they saw the first driver dive into the pits they thought right opportunity for an undercut all of us are going to get drs again we can have our own little drs train this is going to work out great and that's exactly what they're doing they've caused a little bit of disruption with the likes of tygo hardy and yoris forcing them to burn a bit of battery to keep the drs to the cars around them Give them the two soft compound runners, dived it into the pits. This is where we're going to start seeing the gaps open. This is where we're going to see the drivers start pushing that little bit more. And once a one or two drivers start pushing, that's when the rest of them are all going to start pushing. But we are having the rest of the medium runners dive it into the pit lane here on lap 12. Nice and early, wanting to cover off those drivers who have already made their stop. Yep, so of course a one lap overcut for those now who are making their pits up. We'll see what sort of effect that has once they've been into the pit lane. We can see, of course, now... Um, Joel just heading through it because he further back there. Duncan Hoffland on the rear of Jack West. So these two are technically the leaders in this race. Joel, uh, Jack, Duncan and Isvan, the top three. But obviously other people still have to pit and some of them will be pitting a lot later because of them being on a set of the hard tyres. And we can see there now, they go side by side into turn one. Duncan gets past Jack West now into P13 goes Jack West. And also Pookie there looking to make a move into turn one as well. What happened to him there? No, no, he's looking to make a move. I think it was people coming out to the pits because we can see the two McLarens here looking to battle here. Jack and Declan fighting with the um, two Ferraris as well. This fan gets pushed off circuit as they head through turn number three. Now in towards turns four and five. I was caught a little bit napping there, Josh, as they headed through um, turn one. Yeah, Jack West is from Pookie having a brilliant little ding-dong battle. Uh, Istvan initially pushed Jack a little bit wide, so uh, Jack decided to give a, a little return of a medicine and give Istvan a little bit of a shove there, and it's still going on now. The McLarens really trying to work together. The Logic Academy drivers Ooh. both of the same note, but a little bit of contact there for Jack West is going to pay the ultimate price. Ishvan Puki just tagging the rear of him. I believe Jack West wanted to get across him uh, towards the apex a little bit sooner than Ishvan was anticipating. Made contact. It's going to be very unfortunate for Jack West, but we know the pace that driver's got. He's just going to try and pick himself back up. Look forward to a potential safe car in this race. But Ishvan Puki, Dylan Warren, I mean, you talk about an undercut. They're right next to each other now. Yeah, we'll have to see what the two Ferraris can do together to make this strategy work. And, you know, at one point, Isfan was, what, 10 positions back from Dylan there. He was a position ahead after the pit stop phase. And that was just because he made a pit stop one lap earlier than Dylan Warren, as we can see them now. Head down towards turn number one. Duncan Hoffland takes the fastest lap of the race. Uh, we can see Max Liesel there looking to gain in on the rear of Joost Nordijk in towards turn one as well. Duncan Hoffland looking to make a move on the rear of Max Liesel as well as they head through in towards that first set to now. And the fight for the victory could go into anyone's hands because Ishmael, Tycho and Yoris saying out very late on the, on the hard. Obviously, probably, I believe, going to a set of the softs, maybe, or the mediums, maybe. I'm not sure, but... Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting one what they could do. They could also be on the best strategy here, I think. Yeah, and now this is where we're going to bring you back to your question. You're Joel Marquardt. You've got a net race leader behind you. Behind him, your teammate. Yep. Now this is a part where you can hold up the field if you choose to do so. But Joel, letting both the drivers through to battle for the lead, but not letting Duncan through. Trying to go defensive against Duncan here is going to be key. Just trying to give Max Wiesel enough breathing space where he's able to make that move. Maybe try and break a little bit of DRS, but it wasn't enough. We didn't get to see the TF10 Mercer of defense because Duncan Hoffman's been able to serve himself through. Keeping hold of that DRS all importantly, but Declan Barrett's going to be the next one to try and make a move on this Red Bull. It's going to look like the widest chicane you've ever seen when it comes to Qatar, isn't it? 
indeed. You can see them they're heading into the final corner and still Joel looking to defend. Declan a bit of contact onto the rear of Joel. Now they head down to turn one shortly. Um, Declan's got to use his battery to get past. Otherwise, he's in a really poor position and he can't actually find the move. So Joel will probably go to the inside if he can. Yes, he will move to the inside. Declan's forced to go to the outside line to turn one there. Joel breaks there to go deep. Declan goes all the way around the outside. Brilliant move there from Joel. And that's going to be Isfam Puki through into P7. What a move there from the Ferrari. You now ahead of Declan and ahead of Joel in the matter of corners. And now it's Dylan Warren's turn to try and make a move ahead here of Joel Marquard. And you can see Joel looking to send it on the back of Declan, but couldn't quite do it. Brilliant work here from Joel to try and hold people, to try and disrupt them and break their flow a little bit here in this race. Yeah, absolutely. He's doing exactly what he needs to do for the team. Of course, he's not going to be very popular amongst drivers for causing this little bit of ruckus that he's doing at the minute. But so far, he's certainly shown himself why he is picked to race here at E-Series by TF10. Play the team game, doing exactly what he needs to do. Putting up a very big distraction here for a lot of these drivers, causing him to lose a little bit of time here and there. It all adds up at the end of the day. But meanwhile, while all that's been going on, we've had Joris Tima Zelenkovic, Kian Gorondorp, and Louis Valentin dive into the pits for a medium compound tyre. And they're just a little bit off the way of this pack here. Sixth and Lindhart's going to be the first one up on the hard compound tyre we're going to have to get past. But looking further on throughout there, they've got a lot of work to do to try and reclaim couple positions. Yeah, indeed. We'll see what these medium runners can do. Lots of Yaris and Tima, Kian and um, Louis. We'll see what they can do. Maybe they can try and make some key moves and get ahead of those who are on the hard tyres. But we can see, of course, pit lane there for Tycho and Sergio. Still, it will be... Ishmael Fassi, the only one to stay out on the set of hard tyres, so he will be going longer than all of these who have pitted onto a set of the hards. He's going to be in a very good strategy here because I believe he will go mediums now, Josh. Yeah. Surely. As we can see there, that'll be Keen looking to make him move ahead of Tycho as they head through in towards turns three and turns four. Kian getting closer, but not enough there to make a move ahead of Tiger Hardy. Also, we can see Tiger Hardy looking to make a move ahead of Zelenkovic to get himself in towards P12 here in this race. And NBR looking quite strong here so far. They're doing a very good job, aren't they? Yeah, they're certainly doing a fantastic job. You know, keeping themselves in, a, in amongst that little mid, midfield area where if anything ends up breaking out, anything occurs to, up towards the top end, they're able to grab an opportunity. But if anything happens behind them, they're equally safe, as we will see Ishmael Fassi diving into the pits for a moment. I was considering what you were saying, and I thought, I've seen Ishmael Fassi do it before, where he's just gone for a complete AWOL strategy <laughs> onto a set of soft compound tyres in the last six laps of a race, uh, and sent moves left, right and centre, uh, around Singapore of all places. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if he did decide to try and drag it out for a set of soft tyres, but he's done the sensible thing, gets onto a set of mediums, he's going to be looking to cover off the rest of the drivers, but he'll have to lose a couple of positions in order to do that, as we see Jost breezing past with the rest of those hard compound runners. Ishmael, he's got a bit of work to do, to say the very least, as we've got a potential four wide moment heading into turn one. Yeah, we did go forward for a second. It's going to be Tiger Hardy now ahead of Sixth and Lintart just behind the Maka team is Lenkovic and now looking to also close in onto the Maka of Yaris Crows. And as they head through and all that battling has sent one of them off track and also it's brought Ishmael Fassi into ahead of them all. So now Ishmael Fassi is on the best strategy possible. He's got brand new mediums and he's only a second back from those on the hards. Absolutely brilliant stuff there from the Williams engineering crew to figure that one out. I'll tell you what, I wish I had a brain capacity the same as those guys working at the strategy there because, my word, fantastic work. But we've still all got this, you know, all breaking down, all going on. We've still got moves. John Marquardt still wanting to be a pain in the bosom for a couple of these drivers. And now he's got Jack West fighting for position there. Looking to try and get my move sorted to the inside. Jack West with a very, very audacious overtake. Not leaving too much space there for Joel Marquardt. Pick up a time penalty for it as well. It's not looking great. It's not been a great race from a Veloce driver. But there's still a lot of potential to go for the remainder of this race. We've still got 12 laps remaining. Safety car, still possible. Depending on how much these drivers want to push. If any of them are going to take any risks. Or if any more hardware is going to fail. We've already had two uh, pieces of hardware fail today. Let's hopefully not make it through. Of course, and now a three-second penalty for Tamash Gell there. So, all right, Jake, going to be dropping down a few positions in terms of um, Tamash Gell's position at the moment. Big shame for him to now have that penalty, of course. And we can see moves being made. Sabrino looking to get ahead of six and Lintart into turn one. Lintart breaks later, but he's on the hard tyres. Uh, Sergio's on the brand new mediums. He goes to the outside, pulls to the inside Ooh. of turn two, and contact into turn number three. And still, I think Sergio gets a move done and completed ahead of six, and he does. And into P into P12 goes Sergio, and into P13 goes Kian Gordendorp. As also, we could see there Ishmael Fassi make a move ahead of, um, of Tarash Gal there. Yeah, very, very... Um... 
That's, that's, that's an opportunistic. That's the word I was looking for. I wish my fast to get that move sorted on Tamash Gal, finding that opportunity right where the mistake happened. And, well, he climbs up into P7. But Williams leading the standings. How much risk does he want to take trying to get through this field now? Well, he's got to do a lot of. He's got to just send it, hasn't he? I think he knows all these ahead of him. You know, they'll give him racing room. They'll be nice, and you know, I'm sure they'll, they'll do some hard fair racing. So yeah, Richmond's just got to. He's just got to send it left, right, and centre. Really, he's got the better tyres. He's on the medium, so you know, I, I can't see why he can't fight for the lead. And then, if he can, try and just pull a decent gap to those uh, second below. So we'll see what he can do. As we can see, Declan Barrett here pushing his fan Puki through a few of the corners. I saw it last lap. His fan was nearly under pressure. Um, from the back of Declan. So we'll see, can Declan try maybe take P4 away from the Ferrari? As we can see, Joris Crowe's on there, into P8 ahead of Tima Zelenkovic. And we can see as well, Tamash Gal being overtaken by three cars into one corner. That shows how OP that DRS is along this track. Tamash Gal losing three positions into one corner there. Yeah, it's... Oh, you that's know, a spin for Zix and Lindhart. Into turn one, bit of contact with Jack West. Ooh. Oh, dear. Well, Jack West isn't helping his case. I've seen you all in chat. I'm gonna have to ask you all to be, um, you know, on your best behaviour. But Jack West, I'm sure the shoes report's piling up for him at this point. Wow. It's not been a race to remember. <laughs> it's uh, certainly gonna be one to forget at a, at a rapid rate of knots. Uh, maybe learn from as well. But the other half of the Veloce Academy garage, Declan Barrett, he's having an absolute stellar race so far. He's indeed. Declan's done some brilliant pace, of course, for the Veloce Academy team, as that is going to be Ishmael Fassi pulling alongside and ahead of Dylan Warren before turn 12. What a move there from Ishmael Fassi. We know he's going to be on the quicker tyres. We know these moves aren't going to be um, much of a task here for Ishmael Fassi, as he now looks to close in already on the rear of Declan Barrett as they head into turn number 15. There you can see they're just pulling behind the rear of the McCann on the exit, pulls to the inside, has got to pull alongside, pulls ahead into turn 16. Ishmael Fassi now into P5. Next on his target will be Ist Van Pukki in the Ferrari, looking to get himself now into P4 is Ishmael Fassi, but Declan's getting in here. He could look to try... No, he's not going to look for a move. He's not close enough to make a move as they head into turn one. So for now, Ishmael just sits in that train on the back of Ishmael. They will be looking to make the moves here in the corners. How long is he going to be behind Ishvan uh, Ish Well, That's the real question. Ishmael Fassi clearly showing those mediums have got an electric pace in comparison to these hards, and he's not going to be waiting long at all. Damn the inside at turn four. Fantastic stuff there from Ishmael. Next on the chopping block will be Declan Hoffland. Now, Declan Hoffland. where's he going to... Duncan Hoffland. Declan? <laughs> Who's Declan? Declan Barrett. There we go. I knew I was getting it somewhere. But Duncan Hoffland, it's going to be a tall order. Yeah. Try and keep this medium compound behind. Is it worth fighting at the minute? No. No. You just let him past. It's completely fine. Towards the end of this race, there could be an option to try and bite back at this medium compound tyre. But worst case scenario, you end up going off your racing line trying to defend. Yeah, well, I, th I think that's pretty much what Puka did. He literally let um, Is uh, Ishmael through because I think he knew that he wasn't really able to fight at all with the medium run-up. And we can see there now Ishmael Fassi into third ahead of Duncan Hoffland there, looking to try and take the lead of this race possibly or even just stick behind the back of Joost Nordijk and have that DRS advantage for his case and then also use the tyre advantage at the end of the race. Um, Tripkov gets a three-second penalty now in this race. Quite a shame for him to make his good day from go to, uh, to go from bad to worse. We can see now Ishmael Fassi gaining in here on the rear of Max Wies, looking to make a move for P2 as they head into turn one. To the inside goes Ishmael Fassi, stays back behind. What about Yoris here fighting with Dylan Warren and also fighting with Declan Barrett here. Into turn one, two and three. Declan off the circuit, gets a penalty, comes back on. Contact there, they go three, one into turns two and three. It's Declan ahead of Yoris, ahead of Dylan Warren, but Dylan's going to have the inside line to turn four and five. But actually, we've got Yoris on the outside here of Declan Barrett to the outside goes the race, which keeps it around the outside side into turn four round the outside into turn five into turn six he's ahead brilliant stuff and we've got Ishmael Fassi trying to size up and move on Max Wiesel as well got to the inside line Max not interested in defending it so much he's gonna be more than happy to turn back into the slipstream of Ishmael Fassi waiting for an opportunity later in this race but the real question is will there be an opportunity later in this race because at the pace these mediums are showing at the minute they've been absolutely electric Nathan they have indeed so far. We can see as well now Team Izlankovic on the rear of Declan Barrett here on a newer set of medium tyres. So we'll see what can he do. Can MVR try and get a top 10 finish here tonight? That would be brilliant for their championship. I believe they've done it once. Back in, I think it was um, I think it was in Baku, round one. It was Zelenkovic who got P10. So maybe he can try 
and get one better and get himself maybe a ninth or even higher in this race. But behind him is Tycho Hardiner. That is a force to be reckoned with here at the moment because Tycho is on some brilliant pace. He was fighting for pole until he made a mistake. He's now looking to try and fight to get even closer. As we can see, Zelenkovic is pulled to the inside here of Declan Barrett and will be looking to try and take P8. But we can see Ishmael Fassi to the inside here of Nordar can take the lead of the race in towards turn one. Brilliant there from Ishmael Fassi to be in the best position possible ahead of Joost, ahead of Max, who's sitting second and third. And we can see once again now, Tycho Hardy on the attack. Yes. No waiting around up towards the front of the field and certainly no waiting around towards this mid-pack of the train. The medium compound runners using everything their tyres have to offer at the minute, trying to pull away, trying to get moves made in uh, non-traditional places around this circuit, really trying to eke out every bit of grip they have on that medium compound tyre to kind of punish those hard tyres a little bit harder, forcing them to go offline, forcing them to go defensive. So when it comes towards the latter stage of this race, when the mediums won't be looking in the best shape, those hards will equally have the effect of the marbles on them. They won't necessarily feel great. They would have worn slightly quicker in comparison to what they would have normally if they were kind of allowed to run at their own pace, not having to worry about it. You've got Yoris closing up to Ishvan Puki, Zelenkovic still on the back of Dylan Warren. And then, of course, Tiger Hardy, the most informed driver on this grid, I think you could fairly say. At the minute, currently in P10, looking to make his move on Declan Barrett, but he's having to wait that little bit longer because Declan Barrett's found a beautiful little toe behind the back of Timo Zlenkovic. He's holding on really well at the minute. Indeed, and now we can see Ishmael Fassi has broken the one-second gap, but I believe Jost Nordrak got DRS as they head down to toe one, but brilliant there from Ishmael Fassi. It's not often we see people break gaps in races, but it's a one-second gap as they head into turn one. Ishmael Fassi leads away ahead of Jost Nordrak. We can see further back there, Tycho Hardy making a move, or looking to make a move ahead of Declan Barrett. Declan goes wide, Tycho goes to the outside, Declan will have the outside as well at turn three. They go close to contact there, a bit of rubbing there as they head through, and Tycho will be ahead by the time they exit turn three, and now it's Golden Dorp's turn to try and get into P10 and then get himself ahead of Declan Barrett here as well as we saw Joe, um, no that would be Six and Lindhart, sorry, into the pit line there for NVR. So one is loving his position, the other is definitely hating it. Down in P17 with a soft tyre, so looking to try and probably take the fastest lap away in this race as they all head through now, filing in towards the next few corners. And we can see, of course, Sergio Serena also on the attack here. Declan could be down to P12 after this race by the way it's going. Yeah, certainly could be, and it's such a shame as well. He had such a good run in that first, and I mean, end of the day, strategies, they all come, uh, they all end up showing their hand towards the end of a race, but I feel like most of the hands have been shown at this point. Those medium tyres, they look almost incomparable to the hards. They look like they're a whole different brand, let alone the same Pirelli range, because they've just got so much more grip. It's ridiculous. Of course, as we can see them all head through now into the final corner yet again to begin lap 24 of 29. And Ishmael Fassi with a 1.5 second gap now has got to do two things. One, not get a penalty, and two, not let anyone into the slipstream. You can see there, that'll be Hardy trying to get ahead as Lenkovic into turn one to the inside. Very boisterous there from Tiger Hardy, but just couldn't quite get the move done. I think it was actually Zelenkovic making the overtake there on Hardy. So it's going to be Zelenkovic into P8, Tiger into P9. They're looking to go up the inside at turn number three to make it into P8. He does get it done, a bit of contact into turn four. Who will be ahead? Will it be Zelenkovic? Will it be Hardy? Will it be Tiger Hardy? Bit of a tap, though, from Tima as they head in towards turn number four and five. And now he will be under pressure here from Keen Gordendorp as they head in towards turn number six. Yeah, this is where they're also going to have to be very careful. You see the red light flashing at the back of their cars. It's not raining, don't worry. <laughs> it's the ERS being below 10%, meaning they have reduced engine power. The battery goes into a reserve mode. It wants to save more than it's deploying per lap at this point. They'll lose a little bit of top end power. It's imperative now they're able to maximize their time in the corners for that medium tire to really get, a, get an effect to hold on to the back of Dylan Warren. The last thing they want to do is lose the RS touch to the guys up towards the front. Indeed, as they all head through towards turn 13 and 14 now. I'm on the board here with Declan Barrett looking to just try and hold on because he's got Kian ahead of him. He's now got Sergio Sabrino behind who will also be looking to make moves here. I don't think there's much that Barrett can really do here in this position. We can see at the front still, Fassi has got a two second lead ahead of Nordic and Max Feasley in P3 and Duncan Hoffman there in fourth looking to close in here and try and fight for a podium position here, but I think the battle is now for P2 rather than P1, which isn't something you really see around Qatar. So you'll head through and towards turn number one now and looking to continue on with this campaign. That 25-29 is underway, so four laps to go here in this race, and we can see now Kian Gondorp here looking to make a move ahead of Timur Zelenkovic here. Yeah, but keep an eye on that battery usage for Kian. He's got the red light flashing too now. 
these medium tires are really trying to push her battery all the way to the uh, finish here. Trying to deploy everything they can on the straight to give them the best opportunity to get close oh. for these corners for an overtaking move. As we see a little bit of contact there from Sergio Sabrino, Declan Barrett. Declan... Sergio Sabrino decides to uh, not take advantage of the opportunity. Pulls back off the throttle, gives a little wiggle to say sorry to Declan Barrett. Unintentional contact at the rear. It quite often happens when you've got such a drastic comparison between the two tyre compounds into a braking zone. Yeah, it's one of them, isn't it? You know, I think Sergio just broke a little bit too late, but, you know, we had that respect to, you know, kind of let Declan continue on and be ahead and now look to make it again and not hit the back of the uh, McLaren as he does it. And we can see further ahead his teammate, Joris Krosen. What a race it has been here for the Alpine driver, as we can see Six and Lindhart get a penalty now to make his day also even worse. Then to P18 is the MVR driver and still TES then in 19th. Louis Welch has, has actually recovered here a little bit. Yeah, he's pulled back a, a, a solid handful of time, hasn't he? About eight seconds with all this squabbling going on up towards the front. He's done a fantastic job. But again, still 11 seconds left to gain in three laps. It's going to be a very tall order. Some might think it's impossible, but no, in sim racing, anything can happen. Yeah, It's very unlikely, much. though. I'm, I'm not going to take a coat <laughs> it. It's very, very, very unlikely. Uh, of course it will be, but then again, you never know. Safety cars come out. It can all make cover bright loose, but I don't think now we can get a safety car being as we're on lap 26. Um, so yeah, no more safety car possibility here in this race and quite a surprise not to get one around this circuit considering how some of the drivers have been battling on track at the moment. But we can see, of course, further behind, Dylan Warren here looking to close in and try and possibly try and fart on the back of Joris Crozen here because he's got some good pace here. Has the Ferrari driver, but just not quite yet got close enough to make a move and pop himself up into P6. And Ferrari's day, you know, it was looking bad, wasn't it, earlier, Josh? You know, it was Dylan barely making it through to Q2, barely making it through to Q3. He's fun having those issues with his pedals. But now, they're sitting fifth and seventh. Yeah, looking to grab another good handful of points, jumping them ahead of F7R. And right into the back of Williams Esports as things stand. But of course, that all very much depends on whether Tyker Hard is able to be a little bit disruptive to the likes of Dylan Warren and Ishvan Puki. It's looking less and less likely he's going to have that opportunity to do so on a medium compound tyre. But then again, we have been wrong about Tyker Hardy before, haven't we? He showed he's able to keep tyres alive to the very dying embers of this race, and we might be seeing that once again. But Keen Goddendorp certainly looking to try and get something alive down into turn one. Went to the outside, having to back off there. Timo Zlenkovic doing a fantastic job, currently holding on to P9. But for how much longer is he able to hold on with a driver of the caliber of Kian Gordon-Dorp right on the back of him? It's a lot of pressure for Zelenkovic to do, but certainly holding up very well so far. Of course, as they all file through now towards turn four and turn five, and that gap at the front is just over three seconds. So Ishmael Fassi, what a strategy this has been in this race so far. And even if he gets a penalty now, we've still got enough time to, you know, keep that... Um, first place so brilliant here stuff from the Williams driver obviously we can see in second Nordyke looking to the, keep his position ahead of Max Wiesel and also Duncan Hoffman what a strategy from him 16th now looking to be in fourth Isfam Puki 15th now looking to be in P5 though you know they've really made their strategies work well by going onto a set of the softs at the start and Trip Cub also into the pit lane once again now looking to get into a set of softs to probably try and get the fastest lap what Sixton tried to do but I don't think Sixton could manage it yep uh, looking at this, right, we've got a couple laps left to go. Ishmael Fassi, he's won. Yeah, definitely. So far. Still, if he makes a mistake, still up, up for debate. Well, this battle for P2 is heating up. Max Wiesel sitting behind here, six tenths back. You know he's saving the RS. We don't, we don't even need to discuss it. We know he's waiting for opportunity on the very final lap to try and make a gamble, try and take a, take it a little risky. Sabrino. Ooh. Close again. Very close again. This time, I thought he was going to hit the back of um, Keane into turn one. Oof, very late break in there from the LP. But that shows he's got pace in the car. Yes. I mean, uh, Joris, very much similar. Mm -hmm. With Ish Van Pukki heading into turn one, getting very close within a tenth of the Ferrari driver, showing a lot of these cars have a little bit of extra pace they're willing to give. They're just trying to hold on for as long as they can and make that last uh, last lap, last minute overtake to give such a, a minimal advantage to the car around them to really try and capitalize on the car maybe going off racing line maybe getting a bit of marbles on the tires not necessarily getting the best run for a quarter they're just waiting they're trying to find the opportunity trying to seize the moment where it's going to be mostly beneficial to them of course as we're, i'm going on board here with duncan hoffland in fourth looking to get a podium here tonight you know it'd be very good for him to get a podium i think after where he started so we'll see what he can do in this position max Fiesel got a four tenth gap to second place obviously being Yes, Nordyke, and with two laps left to go, 
we've got uh, Mishmael Fassi in the lead by 4.2 seconds now. We will begin the final lap of the race, I believe, as he heads across the line. As Joris gets a penalty, big shame for Joris Crozen, but it's the final lap of the race now. As I head down to turn one, Joshua can see Duncan Hoffland here looking to gain in and make a move. Absolutely. We've got more moves breaking out throughout the field. Dylan Warren pushing Joris all the way to the end of that turn one. We're still seeing all these sort of events break out across the entire field. We've got Keir to keep it honest towards the back. Max Wiesel looking to try and close back up to the back of Nordstein, but it doesn't look like he's quite got the pace at that first sector. It's all going to come down to the second sector, isn't it? Who's going to be willing to make that bold, audacious move, really going out of their way to try and make it happen? That's where the overtake's going to happen. It's going to be something bold. It's going to be something creative for these drivers. Where are they looking to get it sorted, Nathan? Well, in terms of the battery, Max has got 50%. Yost has got about 10 So I think the main really move will be down towards turn one because they do have DRS, of course. So this is the perfect position for Max to be in. Use a little bit now to keep with the rear of Nordic and then make it as they head down towards turn number one, but obviously finish the race as it's quite a long run to that start-finish line. And we'll see what Max can do here. You can see just closing in there, that gap, three tenths of a second. It's going to come down more as they head in towards the final couple of corners. But we're going to go back to the front here. Ishmael Fassi started on pole position, went for the hards, just loving it when he saw all, uh, all those on the mediums behind. He will come through up towards the start-finish line. It will be Ishmael Fassi who wins here in Qatar. And now a battle to the line between Max and between it, Jost Nordok. And it will be Max Faisal who takes second ahead of the RHG in third. And Duncan Hoffman will finish in fourth. But look at the gap there between P2 and th um, P3, Josh. Ridiculously close. Uh, I promise it's not Josh Nordschleifer. It's Josh Nordbeik. Again, getting confused, getting excited, getting too carried away. But again, fantastic race there. Right up towards the line. Duncan Hoffland as well. Ishvan Puki, great results for them considering the qualifying they had. But overall, a driver almost head and shoulders above the rest here today. Ishmael yeah. Fassi picks up a race win. Dominant performance. It's not often you get to see it around Qatar, but Ishmael Fassi certainly showed he uh, is uh, definitely one to look forward to for the future. And I don't feel like the future's too far away at this moment in time. Definitely not. It's not often you see people making a four-second gap in a race at all, never mind here no. in E-Series, which is one of the most competitive grids here in league racing. But, you know, look at that. NVR, top nine, brilliant from the team to, you know, try and finally get something they want. For many teams, oh, it's only ninth place. But for NVR, that is brilliant. They've done it. You know, They've done it. A top ten, they're happy with that. TES still hunting for a top ten. That will now be 14... Obviously, you know, we've had seven races, so it's 14 drivers in total that have not made the top 10. That's, oh, it's not good for TES, is it? And this time, they finish back of the pack. So yeah. they've got to, they've really got to think of something there because it's just going worse and worse. It's like their performance is getting worse, which is not something you could think of, you know, from what they've been doing so far this season. But we'll see. The Williams on the top step of the podium, of course, being Ishmael Fassi to try and extend that championship lead. And I think they will do by a decent chunk to um, F7R in second place. But we can see it's obviously Ishmael Fassi who wins ahead of Max Wiesel, ahead of Joost Nordijk in third, or as if Josh calls him, Joost Nordschleifer in third. And Absolutely. then it'll be Duncan Hofland in fourth. And the two Ferraris in P5 and P6 ahead of Tiger Hardy in seventh there. Keen Gundorp in eighth. Tim Zelenkovic in ninth. And Sergio Serena around at the top ten, followed by his teammate Joost Crozen in P11, then we have Tamash Gull in 12, followed by Louis Valentin, Joel Marquard, Louis Welch, six on the entire Yano Truck Club, and then the two VAs will move up into their positions, but they left early, so it dnf them. But they will be, I think Declan was P13, and I think Jack was P16, so they'll move back into their respective positions. And we did, of course, lose Fran Mraviak due to a wheel disconnect. But look at all those yes. penalties, Josh, and key thing to note, it's all those below the top 10. Yes, they was just pushing that a little bit too hard. They didn't seem to have that extra pace that the likes of Max Wiesel, Ishmael Fassi, Josh Nürburgring all had <laughs> in, uh, in, in the reserves to be able to crack out at a moment. Duncan Hoffman and Ishvan Puki, happy for them to get back into a position where they were able to show the race pace they've got. They know they have that pace to battle up at the front. Unfortunate qualifying for both of them, but they were able to do something a little different, a little creative, and being able to make it work. It's fantastic for them. Of course, and we'll see if we can get some interviews in all. Um, pop over to the interview screen quickly and we'll try and get um, one of them in. We've either got the flying Spaniard of Ishmael Fassi, the old man Max Wiesel, or the um, the German circuit, Joost Nordijk. So we'll see if we can get cool. any of them in. As, we um, do have Max Wiesel. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. If you can drag him in, Josh will have a quick chat with. Yep, we will have so. to change combox though. 
Oh. Become... <laughs> yeah. I forgot yeah, we're yeah, the exactly. private call. Yeah, we'll, exactly. We'll right, hop in. over. You in. Right, we'll drag them in because Josh ended up going right. into the waiting room. Mm. No, right, you can't blame me for that. I saw you jump in the waiting room. <laughs> okay, Maybe okay. I did. So, Max, hello, welcome in. Um, you know, the oldest driver in PS Jalee himself. Peter in the race. It was a very good race, wasn't it? Yeah, first time Qatar uh, and it didn't went horrible. So, <laughs> yeah, finished F2 P18. So, uh, that was my, my worst wreck the whole game. Uh, to be honest, and yeah, I got to, to manage to find some pace, and yeah, I really take this. Unfortunately, my Q3 run was completely dark. Um, yeah, I mean, pole with only a tenth missing was easy in, but yeah, it's really hard to get a lap in on this track, especially with invalids and ERS and all the management you have to do during the lap. So, great, uh, good points. I mean, we are unfortunately a bit back, so but for me, great race, and I take this. Yeah, of course, I think you're. About 50 points back from um, Veloce, but they also had a bit of a poor race. So to be fair, you'll only be about, um, you know, about 20 points back. So it's still been a bit of a recovery drive for the team. And obviously with four rounds left to go, do you think you can try and get yourself any higher than eighth? Yeah, I mean, uh, we should try always to get the highest possible result for sure. Um, we will see. I mean, Veloce is also not a really bad team, as we all know. So it's not that easy to gain uh, 50 points out of nowhere. Uh, we will see. We will do our best, and then we will just see uh, or find out where we end. So, yep. Well, that's all from me. So congratulations on the second. Anything from you, Josh? Other than looking forward to Wednesday, Imola, do you have oh. any, sort of, any sort of hint about a liner? Uh, uh, if you believe it or not, but Qatar and uh, Imola are the two worst tracks for me, the, the complete <laughs> game. So, uh, But I already know that I have to drive. So, um, yep. So you will see me back on Wednesday, um, hopefully in the commentator's box. But I don't think, to be <laughs> honest, um, as, uh, as I said, I really didn't get any time on pace there. Yeah, um, but we will try our best as always. Absolutely. You've got to keep that positive momentum up. Great job on the podium, Max. I mean, through and through, fantastic race, mate. Thank you. Thanks for commentating, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Uh, bye bye. And next we have, as Josh likes to call him, Joost Nordschleifer in the country. Absolutely. Box. Joost. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome in, mate. Uh, P3 in that race. Brilliant job. Can you hear us? Um, yeah, I can hear you guys. Brilliant. So, you know, I think that race is quite well after. Um, you was in the you was on the podium yesterday, wasn't you as well? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, P three in F two, P three in um, E series. I think that race went quite well. And did, was there any reason why you didn't let Max pass pass down towards turn one on that final lap? Um, I was way lower on battery than Max, so and he had a very I think he had a slide on the last corner, so I had like I had a gap from six to seven ten, so. I could stay ahead at that point, and I know, and I knew my tyres were still feeling quite good. So I maybe on a low battery, I can still have just enough gap to to keep him behind at at the at the end. But he had the battery, and I didn't. So yeah, it's just unlucky. Yeah, indeed. But I think either way, you know, it was a good race. Obviously, you know, fight for some very big points. Obviously, Tamash's race didn't go too well. He was down in twelfth, but I think still in terms of where you're on the championship, you might gain a little bit on Ferrari because you obviously was ahead of them. So you might be looking to try and take third away. In this um, in this championship, do you still think that the championship fights on? You've got about forty points to the back of Williams, who are looking quite strong at the front. Um, yeah, I think we have a very good lineup, so and we got a lot of good drivers. So I think uh, we were still in the in the in the championship fight, and we will do everything to to get up there. Yeah, of course. Well, that's all from me. So congratulations on third. Anything from you, Josh? Again, same sort of thing. Emil on Wednesday. How are you feeling? Um, I don't know if I'm driving for Imola. Um, I don't think so, by the way. Um, but normally Imola is quite a good track for me, but I don't really have like the time on the Fridays to to have a good practice. So yeah, that's the reason why. Okay, interesting. I mean, once again, congratulations on uh, on the podium. Unfortunate not to grab P2, but you showed pace, you showed heart throughout that entire race. Fantastic stuff there, uh, Mr. Nurburgring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had uh, I uh, I had one free warning, so I just needed to to get that, to get that uh, to get the time. So I went completely straight. But yeah, yeah, brilliant stuff, mate. Brilliant stuff. Well done. Yeah, thank you.
And finally, we'll speak with our race winner, Ishmael Fassi. Welcome into the Compture Box, mate. Can you hear us? Hello, I can hear you. Brilliant. So this race, well, it couldn't have gone any better. Pole position, and in the end, you won by four seconds. I bet when you was on that start line and you was on the hards, was you quite happy to see everyone else behind you on the mediums down to P8? To be honest, I was quite surprised that people started on mediums. I was like, yeah, uh, uh, 20 seconds before we were starting the race, I was I was watching uh, the the race director and I saw like eight people behind me on mediums and I was like, uh, yeah, they will change later. But they did not. So <laughs> it was quite surprising. But yeah, um, when they started pitting earlier than me, um, I I was lapping that slow compared to them on on the hearts. I was like I'd say one one second one point th well yeah around a second second and a half. So yeah, when I pit, I was already close to them. Uh, the pace had, well the tire advantage is insane as you've seen, and I could cap them and yeah won the race. Yeah, it was uh, quite smooth sailing. Obviously, once you made that pit stop, you caught up, made those easy moves, and then it was easy just to gap away from um, Joost in second and, of course, win um, by four whole seconds. So do you think that was a matter of strategy, or do you also think that your pace around is genuinely quite quick? Uh, I was surprised with my pace, though, with uh, 120 FPS. Not going to lie, but <laughs> I I'm sure it, it was more about the, the, the strategy, not because being a lot quicker yeah. uh, or quicker. So... If people had started on 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 hard, uh, I'm sure they they would have finished close to me or even in front of me. I don't know. Yeah, well, anything could have I happened, mean, but it doesn't matter. You was four seconds ahead. Yeah, I mean, Ishmael, you've got to give yourself credit for that. If you put myself or Nathan on that strategy, there's no way we would have been able to do that. He was, you know, clear of the rest of the field. I don't feel there's a gentler way to say it. But looking towards the standings, Williams getting that win, Kian finishing P8, not the end of the world. You will gain a couple extra points on the likes of F7R. Enough to keep ahead of Ferrari. Could we potentially be seeing a repeat of maybe what's happened in, uh, in the likes of EOR earlier this year? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know what will happen. I think we've got four races left after this one. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, and anything can happen. You know, the grid is very close. So you might see, I don't know, a bad race from... RIG or Ferrari, well, each one they didn't do poly Q2. I think he disconnected, so uh, it was unlucky, I guess. So, yeah, maybe next week they they get 1-2 and they catch us, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, uh, hopefully we can get, manage the gap to have Savannah to Ferrari, who are third, I believe. Yeah. And we, we can get the championship, but yeah, it's, it's still early to, to say that. Yep, I mean, brilliant stuff. A league of your own today, mate. Take a bow, grab yourself a drink, get yourself a bit of rest. You've fully deserved it, mate. Congratulations on your win here. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Right, so we'll head our way back over to the intermission screen where you can see what's on the screen. I've leaked Discord again. Brilliant. Josh, you need your camera on, uh, mate. What? It, it was on. Uh... Sorry, guys. Oh, okay, you just right, read no, the whole not. chat. It was. It between... was not now. Between Louis and his fan. Oh, I was oh, I was too quick to get onto the intermission screens. That's my fault for being so good at my job. Way too, way too excited. <laughs> Indeed, but that uh, race is, it was good. Second to second to below. The leader just yeah, easy it was. And it wasn't you know, there wasn't much really that Ishmael could do differently to um, of course win that race and but the gap between second, third and all the way down there that you know, you could never call who was gonna finish in what position because of how close they was all making moves into corners which Sometimes you don't expect them to make moves into. We saw multiple times people sending up the inside of turn four and turn twelve, which isn't yeah, normally the cheeky. best place. Yeah, but very cheeky. I think in the end, Josh, that was he's quite a decent race. And the championship wise, it really does change it a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, it kind of condenses that little bit of a lead that you know F seven R and Williams had. It kind of pushes them back a little bit with yeah. Ferrari taking a little a little step up, just grabbing a couple extra points here and there. Expect to see that gap slowly close up closer we get towards the final when these teams are trying to put in quicker and more competitive drivers each and every single week we mentioned before the ones which have a slightly in, more in-depth roster will have time to prepare a little bit better for the likes of Imola before Mexico but again it's one of those but yep. you gotta you gotta work with what you got of course and I think today 
Williams did a brilliant job, of course. Kean, not the best race at all, started 11th, got up to 10th. But, he, you know, we tried his best and he, did, and he, of course, did make a position. So, anyway, it was still an improvement. But, yeah, it was, it was a good race, a good race from them all. And hopefully MVR can try and get a top 10 again this season and, you know, get a little bit higher. Maybe try and challenge TF10 if they can. But I don't think that will be too luck because of Max Wiesel's podium. But... That was all here tonight, guys. Thank you for all for joining. Obviously, make sure to come back next Wednesday for round eight. Which Wednesday. Should have been round seven. Yes. Wednesday. Wednesday. Next Wednesday, Wednesday for round eight, which should have been round seven, but we had issues with the game. Then we'll be back on Friday for round nine at Mexico, which is yet again been another brilliant race. So make sure to keep tuned for those brilliant races. And yet again, thanks to um, from me and Josh for everyone for joining the chat, getting involved and of course, all the drivers are taking part and the teams are getting involved. So we'll be back next time, guys. So have a good one until then. Good night.